uh, Select Board, Tuesday, December 21st, 2021. And let's start off the meeting by asking everybody to please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. In accordance with the requirements of the open meeting law, please be advised that this meeting is being recorded and broadcast live over the Lunenburg Public Access Channel on Facebook Live on the Public Access Facebook page and will be uploaded to the Lunenburg Access YouTube page within 24 hours after the meeting has concluded. If you would like to join this meeting for the purposes of uh, public comment at the beginning and end of the meeting only, you can join using the Zoom application on your smartphone, computer, or tablet. Tonight's webinar ID on Zoom is 909-174-0347. If you would like to participate in public comment at the beginning or end, but do not have, or do not have access to a device that has the Zoom application, you can use the phone by dialing 888-475-4499 and once again, the webinar ID is 909-174-0347. The agenda posted lists all the topics which may be discussed at the meeting and are those reasonably anticipated by the chair. Votes may be taken as a result of these discussions. Not all items listed may in fact be discussed and other items not listed may also be brought up for discussion to the extent permitted by the open meeting law. Open tights meeting and ask if there's any public comment from the board. None. No. Uh, I only have a couple of things that I wanted to announce. First, I wanted to thank uh, our state delegation, uh, representatives Sina and uh, Chris Merrick and Senator Cronin. We had a, a check presentation at the primary school on Thursday. Uh, where they presented the, the town with a check for $25,000 to help the public safety upgrades and fire alarm upgrades at the primary school. Also announced there was that the state budget has secured $50,000 to assist in uh, material abatement at the old primary school as well. So our delegation came out and gave the presentation to the school, uh, the school department and uh, I was there representing the select board and the assistant town manager was there during the town manager's absence and the school committee chair was there as well. So that was a good ceremony. Second, I want to thank everybody who came out for the, uh, the Salvation Army boot drive challenge this weekend. It was turned out to be a perfect day and uh, the people of Lunenburg and anybody passing by through Lunenburg, because not everybody who donated was from Lunenburg, I'm sure. Uh, the generosity was incredible. Uh, we were able to raise, during the challenge part alone, uh, I think like $6,500 uh, during that. And that, according to the people who run it, we, we raised enough to provide over 800 children and 1,200 families of Lunenburg, Fitchburg, and Lemonster with toys, clothes, and food this holiday season. And they thanked everybody uh, from who donated uh, for making that possible. So I want to thank them and everybody who donated in any amount. Every, every single donation helps and it really is to a good cause. And I, I, I applaud the Salvation Army for once and then doing a fine job, especially at this time of year, but they do it all year round. Any public comment from the public? There's Lockwood. Good evening. Good evening. Um, later today, you're gonna in the agenda. You're gonna be appointing, certifying the RAC director. Um, and um, yesterday, the Parks Commission we took a vote, and I had some concerns that since this is the executive body of the town, I want to present my concerns, and I don't think there is a, a commentary at that point. So I just want to use quickly here at that time. Um, I'm, first of all, I'm speaking as myself, not representing the board or the board's opinion. Um, I don't believe right now that the RAC director position has necessarily been set up for that candidate to be successful. And I think we need to think about that before we offering someone 
a job, even if part time. Um, yesterday, during our meeting, I asked Mr. Oliver if the if during the interview process it had been discussed how Mr. Thompson or that position should work as part of a three-way team. And it was not clear that that had been discussed. He said, no, perhaps there was there is an understanding of it. Um, during our meetings, we discussed policies that then the RAC director would then need to enforce. It is important that the RAC director participates in our meetings. Although Mr. Thompson has been in this position on a temporary basis, he has come to some of our meetings, but not all of them. It is not my understanding. I don't know if it's the case. If it has been made clear to Mr. Thompson that coming to our meetings, a once a month meeting, is an important part of the job for him to be successful. And that right now, it's not clear to me. Um, other problems that we have had recently that in my opinion, it was beca it's because the position was not necessarily set up to be successful. As during this past summer, um, there was a lot of programs that were put out for the town to participate. Um, those programs were set up without c close consultation with the Parks Commission. Ended up that we ended up having a lot of offerings that did not have enough enrollment. And therefore, very few programs actually happened. There were, there was not a coordination on these seven. There was no co coordination with uh, securing the locations, making sure the locations were appropriate for some of the programs, and we ended up having problems with a few programs that ran. So that also, I don't believe that is necessarily a candidate problem. I believe that it's a little bit of a leadership problem. We need to set up this position to be successful. Um, and with that, um, I, you know, if we don't have, have a healthy way on how things work, we can't really expect that even a talented and qualified candidate as Mr. Thompson will necessarily be successful in this position because we just don't have how things should work yet. We don't have that set up. And it is not clear to me that that is a concern because that should have been discussed during the meeting. Um, just to be clear, I don't believe this, co this position should report to Parks Commission. I believe the way the hierarchy is in town government is, is proper, just as Mr. Adam Bernie reports to the town manager and works closely with the planning board. I believe this is what this position is set up to be, and I think that's how it should be. Um, and to just wrap it up, I do believe it is the leadership responsibility to whenever you hire someone, to make sure that person is set up to be successful. I don't believe that is the case. And I think the final appointment should be put on hold until we are certain that we have a way for things to work. Um, it's not a question of, uh, for Mr. Thompson, it's really about us as leaders of the town. So that's my two cents, and I appreciate the time. Thank you very much, and have a nice night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment from the public? Uh, sure, uh, Ms. Birchfield. Good evening, thank you. Uh, my name is Terry Birchfield. I live at One Rose Garden Lane, and I'm calling tonight because it's my understanding that uh, Beyond the Rocks Bar will be coming up for its license renewal. And I did have some questions or concerns regarding some of the issues that have been ongoing at the bar, but also um, probably predating COVID, one of the issues being noise and other types of activity from the bar that probably are exacerbated because they have the use of um, patio. And I'm not sure how that works, that um, the patio would be something that would be available to be used for an extended period of time into the evening, or if there's a period of time at which the noise ordinance goes into effect, where the patio should be closed. But certainly of late, part of the you know, issues that have been presenting for some of the residents who live nearby have a lot to do with obviously COVID being an issue and creating um, a need to provide seating outdoors, but it, it does tend to 
Well, then again, I probably shouldn't um, throw my own opinion in there, but to me, it almost looks like it's hard to tell who's a patron and who isn't sometimes. And I think that's one of the other things that leads to some issues. But for me, again, going back pre-COVID, um, one of the issues with, especially on weekends, um, any of the noise issues or um, it's, it's periods of time when it seems to be unsafe seems to also relate to the fact that there there is the use of the outdoor patio and I am curious as to whether or not as part of the licensing process that's an issue that could be uh, addressed or raised and uh, other than that thank you very much and I hope you guys have a great evening and a great Christmas thank you you too thank you thank you <laughs> Any other public comment from the public? Is there anybody else on Zoom? No. 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 Okay. Uh, any announcements? Yes. Um, I received a notification from the Board of Health that their Neshoba Associated Boards of Health will be holding a booster dose clinic on Wednesday, January 5th at, from 1 to 5 p.m. That's going to be held at St. Anthony's Church Hall at 33 Chapel Street in Shirley. And so there's, uh, this has been posted on the town Facebook page, and uh, we'll send via the townwide email as well. And also I'll uh, announce town offices, town buildings will be closed in observance of Christmas Eve this Friday, in observance of Christmas Day on Monday and will be also closed on Friday, um, January, December 31st. There is one more thing under appointments uh, that, or announcements I should say, that uh, we should say <coughs> is that, and I'm sorry Ms. Lockwood just left, but the um, Parks Commission is having a community design charrette for the Marshall Park design plan. That will be on, I believe it's Thursday, January 6th, that's, that's a Thursday, correct? Okay. Thursday, January 6th, 2022, from 7 to 9 p.m., where the uh, land, landscape architects from the company WOLA will be here. I think it's at Town Hall. Mm -hmm. And via Zoom as well. And via Zoom. So you can come in person or via Zoom, and they are going to talk about the, the overall master design plan that they are trying to put together for Marshall Park. So they are looking for input from the public. So again, January 6, 2022, Lunenburg Town Hall, 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Okay. Appointment 705, all alcohol license violation hearing for JK Waterfront, doing business as On The Rocks, 96 Lakefront Ave. And so in, in our Google Drive, we have the procedure for this uh, now I see that the the alcohol license holder is not present uh, I don't know that I've seen this before so I'm going to ask if you do we have any is there anything that we need to know, or can we proceed forward without their presence? They were notified, and it was served on them. Um, Chief Gamble. Mr. Chair, if I may, uh, they were served in hand. They were notified by phone also. Have a receipt. Thank you. So they were delivered the notification of this hearing on December 13th, and it was signed. Mr. Rickard and explain to him that this hearing was gonna occur. Okay. So. No, with, unless there's a reason not to have it, I'm more than happy to have it. <coughs> so, first of all, it's an official hearing and so, uh, everyone testifying must be sworn in and in the order the order of the proceedings will be as follows so we will swear in the complainant 
uh, the town and the license holder. The town will present its testimony and any evidence they have and any accounts they have. Then the license holder or their representative may present their own testimony. At that point, after we've heard both sides of the testimony, the board can ask question of either side, at which point we can deliberate. The next step would be that we would make a finding, and depending on what the finding is, we'll determine a penalty if the finding is against the license holder. Then the notice of the decision is issued via certified mail. So um, the, of course, the possible findings is that the violation that is being br brought before us, we agree has occurred, or we find that no violation has occurred. So with those ground rules being set, um, I would ask anybody who's going to give testimony to please stand and raise your right hand. And do you swear that all the testimony you'll be giving in this hearing is the, all the truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God. Thank you. Thank you. When I do have you come forward to testimony the first time and only the first time, just please identify yourself for the, the record and for the recording. All right, so the town will present their testimony. Chief Gamble. <clears throat> Good evening, Mr. Chair. Chief Thomas Gamble from the Lunenburg Police Department, um, acting as the agent for licensing authority. Um, I'll give a brief summary of what, what occurred and what we uh, found at uh, two violations at On the Rocks. Um, it was brought to my attention on for the Thanksgiving weekend that there were two violations that occurred. One on Wednesday, November 24th, that involved the overcrowding of the bar. And the second on Friday, November 26th, which involved a assault and battery that occurred within the bar and outside the bar. Um, on the 24th, Officer Brock performing patrol duties at approximately 914. He was checking the local bars as we usually do on a busy night like that. He noticed that there was a lot of vehicles out in front of On the Rocks uh, when he pulled in. He walked up to the door, opened the door, and found that the bar was overcrowded. By his estimation, there was well over um, 200 people within the bar. At that point, he made an announcement that he was there, um, instructed the two bartenders to shut down the bar, turn on the lights, and had people start leaving. He called for a fire captain to come down uh, to assist him in counting the oc occupancy at the bar, which is rated for only 99 people. Um, at that time, they counted 137 patrons within the bar. Uh, by his estimations, at least 100 patrons left um, prior to Captain Reese's arrival at the bar. Um, when he observed the employees that were on site, there was only two bartenders, no manager, nor, uh, nor was there anybody at the front door to check IDs or check counts or make counts of the bar. Um, Mr. Ricker was notified, who was the owner, um, I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Kenneth Ricker, who is the owner of the bar, was notified immediately and was requested to respond to uh, the bar. Um, he readily admitted to Officer Brock that uh, he was caught off guard, that this was a social media blast from patrons and they ended up all coming to the bar. Um, at that time, he didn't have the proper staff. Um, he appreciated what Officer Brock did by shutting down the bar. They got everybody out, cleaned the bar. They began a count and allowed people back in to the tune of, I believe, 90 patrons were allowed to be back in the bar when proper staff was, was um, appropriately uh, situated. Um, all the incident uh, from that night was recorded on body-worn camera. I provided the disc, so if you, if you need to view the disc, it's there. Um, when you look at the disc and you look at the video footage, the bar was extremely crowded. Um, it presented a, a very dangerous situation. Re, re, if there was some type of disturbance that happened in the bar, there was no way that it was going to be controlled. Uh, the second concern is if there was ever a fire or, or some type of emergency within that bar, they, they would have been uh, pretty serious. It would have been hard to get to. Um, the second incident involved on Friday um, of that week, we were called to the bar for a report of a man laying down on the sidewalk who had just been involved in a fight. 
Uh, when Officer Capucci arrived at the scene, he found the victim lying down on the sidewalk, um, and he had been involved in a fight within the bar and then again outside the bar. Uh, initially, it was found that uh, during the investigation that the fight that occurred outside the bar was involved the patrons that were originally inside the bar. When they were outside, another incident happened. The two combatants started fighting again. Four other people jumped in, picked up the victim, and body slammed them on the ground. Uh, we essentially reviewed the video, looked at the video, and a fight did incur inside the bar. Uh, the bouncer, a doorman, immediately broke it up, removed the patrons that were involved in the fight, and, and got them out of the bar. Uh, but in doing so, they failed to maintain any type of security outside the bar. Um, if they would have responded or the door people would have responded by calling the police when this happened, uh, this incident could have been prevented outside. Um, it, it almost appeared as soon as they put them outside, that was the end of it, and they think that the, that stops their responsibility. And with our rules and regulations that are set forth by the Board of Selectmen, that, that's not true. They have a responsibility as soon as they leave the bar that's outside in the parking area, whether it's on the patios, in the street, they're responsible for anything that happens there. Um, that would be the summary of events that occurred, those two that brought this investigation forward. Um, I did make a note um, for the report that I provided to the board was that there have been several incidences and disturbance calls that have been occurring at um, on the rocks for the past year during this COVID situation. Part of it is, is, is definitely related to the patios, and which uh, was brought to your attention during public comment, and that, that is a de direct result of that. Um, Mr. Ricker was, was fully cooperative with, the, with that type of situation. He changed the hours, he closed certain patios, um, and it kind of, as the weather changed, more people went inside, so you're not getting those disturbance calls as we were getting over the summer. Um, I researched some files and I, I went through the records and this is the first violation hearing we've had with On The Rocks. Um, there's no other violations, no other suspensions or anything that I, that I could find um, in my 20 years that, I, that I've been here. Uh, not to say that that lessens anything that had occurred those two nights, but it, um, it does mitigate the circumstances where he was cooperative, which uh, I'm really um, surprised that he's not here tonight uh, to address these issues. Um, he's well aware that these issues have occurred, and there's certain steps that they need to take to, um, you know, to remedy these and resolve these issues. Uh, responsible ownership of a bar is, is, is huge. We need to prevent people from getting hurt. We need to prevent people from uh, disturbing the peace that are, that are around the residents there. And we need to find a, a resolution so they can coexist down there. Um, I, I did make a recommendation that if the board did find that these violations were in fact occurred, um, that a written warning be issued. Um, I would, even though that Mr. Ricker is not here, I, I think I would stand by that as just by a fact that uh, this is one of the first violation hearings that we've had for this, for this establishment. Um, this past year has been pretty significant with the calls that we have received there. Um, when I went back and I researched the files and I looked back to see what we were at for previous years, there wasn't many. It, it wasn't a constant uh, disturbance calls like we're seeing now, um, you know, this past year. Um, again, my suggestion would be making some remedies to resolve these issues would be no longer do they have the outdoor patio, um, no outdoor seating, whatever it may be to, to call those um, uh, resolutions. Okay. Questions? Or? No, no, we're going to, are any I other officers going to provide testimony and then we'll ask questions at the end. <laughs> Officer Jonathan. Brock, Lunenburg PD, um, I was the one that responded on uh, the night before um, Thanksgiving. Um, all I can pretty much say is when I got there, it was just so overly crowded. I just saw that it could have potentially been serious injuries that have occurred in there. EMS, fire, or us would not have been able to maintain access. I couldn't even get past the front door. Um, once I announced myself, I do have to say with the amount of people that were in there, with the varying ages that were there, everybody was cooperative. 
nobody gave us a hard time and they did all leave you know respectfully and you know they complied with all of our orders <clears throat> that I gave that night you know for the bartenders to shut the bar down turn the lights on and the people left so pretty much have to say about that night that we were able to take a bad situation rectify it and with them doing such a good job of getting everybody out of there cleaning the place up is when I made the decision to, like, to let them you know reopen get back in with the proper staffing on scene but we they did were very cooperative you know leaving every all the patrons that were there so thank you Good evening. My name is Officer Bucci from Lunenburg Police Department. I'm just going to recap on the night of November 26th that Chief Campbell just talked to you guys about. Um, so there was a fight. We got a report that was outside the bar um, with the male that was unconscious. Upon arrival, we addressed him. He said he was just involved in a fight. He was kind of in and out of it. He was actually transported to UMass Worcester. Um, we went inside the bar. Uh, we tried to obtain video from the bartenders and, and people who were working at that time. No one was able to work the system for cameras at the time. So we had to call Mr. Ricker. Uh, and he followed up the next morning with another officer, one of the day patrol officers. Um, they obtained video, and after watching video, it's clear that uh, there was a fight between one male, uh, the victim, and about four or five other males. Um, it looks like the victim tries to push his way to the front of the bar. It was also crowded that night, too. It was looked shoulder to shoulder. Um, once he got to the front of the bar, the males were kind of looked like they were exchanging words. Um, one of them taunted him. Uh, a couple punches were thrown, pushing and shoving. The bouncer came over, escorted one of the males out came back, escorted the victim out, and came back, and the rest of the males went out, about four or five of them. Outside, it's tough to see, but um, the victim witnesses stated that he was on the sidewalk, the victim, and one male and him started fighting again, and four other males that were just previously in the bar got out of their vehicle, and they picked him up and slammed him on the ground. That's when he fell unconscious. Um, and then those males got into the car and took off and before our arrival. So um, that's all I have to say about that night. Thank you. Thank you. Just quickly reading, rereading the report here. <coughs> so this would be the portion where the licensed <coughs> owner would be able to provide testimony, but I just for the record want to show that there is nobody representing them uh, here. What is the chat? No, that was an old chat. Okay. And I don't, not that it would be appropriate for them to be on Zoom, but they're not even on Zoom. So we have not no notification that they were not going to be here even after being served. So we will go right to the question. So I will open it up to the board members if they have any questions for any of the witnesses. Uh, Chief, did you manage uh, to get a count of the number of patrons in the bar on uh, Friday the 26th? I did not. Um, at that point, our officers were investigating assault and battery. Um, the occupancy rates are, wasn't their concern at that time. Um, obviously, by the video that we provided from that night from inside the bar, it was fairly crowded. Mm -hmm. I have a couple of questions. Sure. Um, can you? Um, Chief Campbell, would you mind explaining or having the officer who served the notice of tonight's hearing just explain for the record what occurred? Sure. Uh, the officer, Officer Capucci, actually called Mr. Ricker, let him know that we were conducting a hearing on this, um, and told him that uh, he had some paperwork for him, provided them with the reports that I provided for the board. Also, uh, my findings, uh, that was provided to him in the packet. Uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, it was a bartender that signed the correct. sign for the packet. I, I gave it to the bartender. He yeah. directly. So he was notified by both phone and the service was made in hand. Okay. You mentioned in your testimony that Mr. Ricker is aware of the previous incidents that occurred at the bar. According to the documents you provided to us, there were 14 incidents that have occurred this year, at least 14 calls, response to recalls. Um, I would assume that Mr. Ricker is aware, but can you just uh, explain that in, in terms of how any communication to make Mr. Ricker uh, aware of incidents? Sure. I, I made phone calls to him. Um, I reached out to him because we were starting to get these calls about the patio and the noise. Um, and 
we we spoke about what he needed to do. We talked about closing the outdoor bar, um, the outdoor patio at, at a certain time, reduce his hours, which he agreed to. Um, he brought his hours back an hour, started closing down the outdoor patio. Um, and one of the suggestions that we had was that side patio was right outside um, the residence right there, and it's directly underneath some of their lanais and their um, porches, so they're going to hear a lot of noise. So we agreed to turn off the music there too and try to move people to the front. Um, you, you know, obviously with the nicer weather, more people were outside than they were inside, and it, it really did cause an issue. Uh, upon speaking with him, he hired um, a doorman or two uh, to make sure that he would try to work with that to try to get people inside. Whether they were effective or not, I, I obviously with 14 calls, you, you know, based on disturbances for that year, they, it was fairly uh, accurate that it was it wasn't effective. Um, but he was well aware that we had several conversations over the summer about this over the phone and to make these corrections. Okay. Um, who called the police on November the 26th? November 26th was the bartender. The bartender. The fight. The Correct. You're, you're speaking about the fight? Correct. Yes, it was the bartender. Now, uh, I want to summarize a couple of the things that were just in the record. Um, so, a couple things were noted that on April the, and, I, and so the question that's going to be at the end of this is if you will concur that this is consistent with the police reports that have been provided on April the 19th an incident in which someone was clearly overserved that was noted in the police report uh, April the 17th an incident in which someone was clearly overserved um, and they also needed medical attention. There was also February the 14th an incident in which somebody was was overserved as noted in their police report. On August the 15th, someone was also overserved. A uh, patron called, let me skip back, May the 30th, a person um, assaulted another person on May the 30th, um, blew a .29 blood alcohol content, uh, and then injured himself in the cruiser, banging his head against the cage. That same person on August the 15th was overserved again, um, called another patron a nigger and a spick, and that staff declined to issue a no trespass. On August the 21st, that there was a fight that resulted in blood and head injuries. On August the 31st, there was another incident in which patrons were, and a patron was overserved, and the police drove that patron home. On September the 24th, um, complaint about the patio being in use after 10 p.m. and on October the 16th an assault in which someone spit booze in someone else's face. Is this an accurate summary of? Absolutely. Thank you. I don't have any other questions. So uh, from the report, well let me start as a follow-up to Mr. Jeffrey's questions. In your estimation, did any of those rise to the level of a license violation? Um, yes, absolutely. There's no denying that. There is no, um, when you look at what's in the report and what we've been dealing with for, for, the, for the year, there's absolutely a license violation. There. That, that there is no denying that. Um, that is accurate. Um, our goal is to try to work with as businesses and, and establishments like this be, to make them aware of these before we bring it before the commission. If I'm here before you, then we've exhausted all avenues of, of providing whatever assistance we can. Okay. Of those 14, how many would you estimate it, and, and just roughly? Mm -hmm. Would, would have constituted a license violation? The ones that Mr. Jeffries spoke of. That would be five, right? And two of them are in, two of them are in one incident. Uh, two of the ARs that we provided to you are from one night, one single night. Um, the incident where alcohol was spit in somebody's face, um, that was, uh, you know, on the outdoor patio again, where there's very little control uh, of what was going on. The, did the owner, license owner get notified on the 24th after that incident of the overcapacity, uh, severe overcapacity, I would say, 
was he notified then that you were going to report this to the licensing authority for Absolutely. hearing? Absolutely. I had a conversation with him. I, when I got back in the office, he'd actually called my office right away to let me know he was aware of these two situations. I tried to call him back. Weren't, wasn't successful. He has a business star. He's, I believe he's a teacher or something during the day, so he couldn't call me back. I finally got a hold of him. And I explained to him there's no other way around this, this that, that these violations, you've been given opportunities, and we're going to bring these violations before a hearing. Okay. Uh, how much time was sp spent there by the officer on the 24th? You say, you know, uh, maybe I should ask this of Officer Brock, but uh, you, you got there and started shutting it down because it was overcrowded. And then, if I understood correctly from the chief, at some point after Captain uh, Reese came, and they did account, but then at some point you were allowed people back in. So how much time did you spend there? I stayed there right until almost 11 o'clock, the end of my shift. Everything, you know, calmed down when everybody was back in there. I passed on to the oncoming overnight sergeant, and uh, they had no other issues the remaining of the night. So from my first time, I don't recall the exact time I got there, I stayed until 11 o'clock. Right. So you stayed at the location for two hours, and we have two people, two Three people on yeah. on patrol. Sure. Okay. I just wanted to make sure that no, no. I I think you did the right night, thing. So. I don't want to question that. I'm just saying yeah. that this this violation caused us to lose one third of the on the patrol force to take care of something of this nature. Yes, sir. Okay. Now on the second on the twenty sixth, the bartender calls that. What is exactly the call? I believe uh, the call was there is a person lying on the sidewalk who was injured in a fight. I believe that was the log entry that I that I seen. Okay. Um, so. And I believe the, the the actual statement was I believe it was injured in a previous fight. Gotcha. I'm, and did it require EMT? Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay. And as the video showed, there, this fight started inside. Correct. So the people who were should be managing the, the bar should have known that. Correct. Okay. And this second fight happened, although not inside the premises, but on the licensee's property of the premises. Technically, it's, it's public way. It was across the entrance of the bar. Uh, but by our regulations, it's a parking area for the bar. They're responsible for what happens there when patrons leave the bar. But while they were, so I just want to make sure this one was not an overcapacity situation or no, not no, this was about the fight, about All the right. assault and battery. So the two violations, according to the report here, is you know exceeding the capacity on on the twenty fourth. Correct. And not properly monitoring for illegal activity, including disturbance and the safety of people, which you say is 111, and I think if I marked it correctly, it is 111.4 for that uh, to protect patrons against injury or to evict unruly patients or to uncover lawful conduct, unlawful conduct. So those are all things they have to monitor Correct. for. Correct. Okay. So. I guess the question I have is since those other five incidents, let's just call them five incidents that Mr. Jeffries brought forward, uh, were not reported to this, to the licensing authority because you wanted to give the owner the opportunity to correct them, correct. which I am going to, at least from my own deduction, indicate he did not correct. Uh, I'm not fully understanding why we should give a writ why would your recommendation be giving a written warning when he, your verbal warnings to him directly from the licensing authorities enforcement arm, which is the Lunenburg Police Department, were not followed, what would give us any indication that a written warning would have any better result? A absolutely. It, it, it's a good question. Would I look at it as progressive discipline? Right. Um, you don't automatically just go unless there's 
something that is so egregious that we should be suspended and revoking them, then yeah, absolutely do what you do need to do. Not that this is not egregious, but I look at it as um, progressive discipline. We've given them a verbal warning. I'm bringing them before the board. I'm requesting a written warning. Um, the next step would be revocation of suspension. Um, I, I think that that lends credibility to the um, investigation that we're doing, and it lends, it, like we're not trying to shut down businesses, and, and that's not our goal. Our goal is to work with establishments to make sure they make these corrective issues. Um, if they're a rogue business that we say, you know what, this isn't working, then by all means, I'd be sitting there going, okay, just shut them down and, and, and revoke their license or, or do what you need to do. Um, you, you know, as, as, you know, it's hard as a police chief to look at this and say, okay, just shut them down, right? Without doing something in between there to give these opportunities to make these corrections. Um, during COVID, we've had issues with other bars that we've worked with, we've had communications with. So to be a fair across the board, um, I wanted to give this opportunity also. Um, and whether the board finds these egregious, I, that's, you know, that's fine with us. I, I mean, we're presenting this as progressive discipline as how we would look at it. The other alcohol establishments, mm -hmm basically the, the, the peers, if you will, of, of this establishment. Have they logged 14 complaints? No. I, I, I can tell you that they're not even as close as being as busy as On the Rocks. On the Rocks attracts um, a, a certain aged group of crowd that comes there. Our other bars and our other establishments are not even close to being as busy. Um, at one time they were. Um, People change, uh, things change, and it's not as busy as it used to be. Right. Summer Street, we used to have crowds on bars down there all the time. Um, Electric Ab, same thing. When I worked nights, we were going for all over the place down there. Um, but apparently that those things have slowed down and they've migrated to um, on the rocks. Well, I don't, I mean, would you necessarily equate busy with more violations or? Cause I would. Be I, I, I think I would because it's the nature of serving alcohol. I, I think if you have a busy um, facility, you are going to get some of these calls. It's just the nature of the beast, and that's what happens. When you have alcohol involvement, you're going to have situations that could arise. It, it, you can't guarantee that it won't. Um, not to the level that we're seeing right now, but yes, we would have those, those type of incidences that happen. Uh, let me just see if I have any other questions here. The first, the, the, the Wednesday, the 24th incident, that was just, that was noted because somebody was just driving by. Right. We, uh, At least we, the, the patrol was just driving by as is usual. Right, right. Well, on, on busy nights, when we know typically that bars are going to be busy, and one of the busiest nights um, all year, including New Year's Eve, is the night before Thanksgiving. People return home, uh, they find a meeting place, whatever it may be, they go, and we know those bars are busy, and our patrols are aware of that, and they make checks on a regular basis. Um, not to say, I mean, if he had the time, he would have been checking the other bars, too. Please? We, we yeah. actually did go to all the other bars that night as well. Yeah. Um, so they weren't. We weren't just singling out on the rocks. We made patrols of every bar, and it's all log, made log, log entries of each one. Um, I believe the fire captain as well went and checked them as well to make sure they were at proper capacity. So, uh, yeah, thank you for clarifying that. that was, my point wasn't that they were singled out. The point is that it wasn't brought to the police's attention. This, this over 200 estimated people, which was double their capacity, was found out just from a normal a normal Two check and stuff. Yes. Right. Okay. Anybody have any other questions for yeah. Mr. Jeffries? Go ahead. Um, I just have two. Um, well, not really more than that, but so you mentioned that this <laughs> caters to an average age. What is that average age? Um, millennials? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Sorry, I don't mean to make light. Um, I, I would say 21 to 31. 21 to 31. 
Okay. That's also we're way too old to do stuff like that. You know, <laughs> just, <laughs> That's also consistent with uh, the ages that were the date of births that were in the police report. The, yeah. It was pretty common that a lot of those date of births were 98 and 99. Right. Um, so very young people. If Mr. Ricker was here, I, I prepared some questions for him, but I, I just want to confirm. So we watched the video that had four cameras showing the incident that occurred inside the bar on November the 26th, as well as there were two cameras that showed outside, but they were difficult to see, see too, too much of what was going on. Um, but I just want to just confirm some things that we observed in the video. And watching that video for 20 minutes, I did not observe them card anyone in that video. Did you observe them card anyone in that video? I did not, no. Okay. But there, um, I, I don't want to, I, I don't want to speak for the owner or, but there, there was a doorman on the night of the fight. Yeah. Because that's the guy that it, um, took the people out. My understanding would be the person at the door cards people before they get to the bar. Yeah. So I wouldn't want to speak for him without him being here. Uh, that's his responsibility to answer that question, but I'm just assuming that's what it would have been. The video also showed a period of time where there was no one at the door um, and people were coming in and out. Um, I want to just note that one of the questions I would have asked Mr. Ricker was how are two people supposed to keep track of the level of intoxication of 100 patrons plus while serving alcohol nonstop? Um, and then also I had a question for Mr. Ricker if he was here about his alcohol policy which states in reference to removing patients or specifically the procedures if a fight occurs that says do not engage in physical contact unless a life-threatening situation evolves. I did observe them engaging in physical contact during that. Was that also your observation? It was. Was there a manager on duty on, on either of these two nights? It doesn't appear to be. Um, I don't, on record, I would have to look at their license to see who's the manager on record. Okay. Because um, I believe they have to have at least one manager on record and somebody that's uh, named as a manager also, I believe, for the licensing. Okay. That's it. Thank you. Mr. Dwyer. Chief, um, based on, on your comments, it appears that most of the incidents in the last year, the increase in the incidents in, um, appear to be based on a increase in, in business to On The Rocks, which can be attributed um, partially to um, the current um, COVID situation and other established, local establishments that may otherwise have accommodated some of this traffic being closed? Yes, I believe so. Um, if you in my report, I, I put down that from 2007 to 2020, there were 50 total calls. And to me, that, that's 50 calls in 13 years. It's not a lot. Um, and then all of a sudden, you have a situation where, wow, we get an explosion of calls there. We get an explosion of people. Um, I don't know the exact details of neighboring communities, but um, some of these establishments were closing early. They weren't staying open as late, or they weren't even open. Um, th that's going to tend to drive uh, customers to wh wherever they need to find. Uh, you also stated that on uh, the 24th, um, I believe when you spoke to Mr. Ricker, that uh, uh, they were unprepared for the number of people um, that, that uh, showed up uh, to the bar. Um, has this been a common occurrence for them? to uh, have an overflow of people that they weren't staffed to handle recently? Uh, not, recent, not recently until we've seen the two videos of what we've seen in the incident the night before Thanksgiving and what happened on Friday night, um, the day after Thanksgiving. Um, not that, um, you know, that we've ever had calls about overcapacity, um, but nothing noted until, until that night. Thank you. Um, so of the, I mean, of the two violations in my mind, I mean, I mean uh, well, let's, well, let's stay with the questions right now. I, I don't know that I have any others. Uh, I will note that our regulations say that a manager or their designee only has to be present 
fifty percent of the opening hours of the of the establishment. So the fact that there was no manager there is not itself a violation. So uh, that's one I I didn't list that as a violation because I just wasn't sure what yeah. time. I read through the whole thing in preparation of tonight, so I, I just wasn't sure who yeah. the manager was yeah. on so, the file. But the other two, the other two are, and, and my, my biggest concern is, they're both concerns, but the biggest concern is that if you're going to pack people in, you know, we've all seen the nightclub fires and stuff like that. It's great to say, you know what, because no one got hurt, we should just give a warning. But you know what, what had happened if something had happened? We wouldn't be having this kind of discussion then. So the violation is the violation, and the seriousness of it is not necessarily uh, directly related to what did happen as much as what could have happened and you know if you get blindsided that okay social media blows up and everybody wants to meet there that's why you have somebody at the door because somebody looks around and says you know what there's nowhere else for anybody to go here you can't be shoehorning people in and they just should have been denied access at that point uh, and that is a responsibility of the license owner. Uh, you know, Mr. Alonzo, don't get me wrong. I, I don't. I, I am not mitigating the fact that there was a serious event there. What I look at is, um, is this is is this is such an egregious event that we need to shut them down? All right. Are, are we are we looking at um, something that happened so egregious that? revoke their license right now, suspend them, send them before the ABCC, let them appeal it there. I look at that as it's a progressive discipline type of issue. You give them a warning or whatever it may be, something else happens down the road. What, what recourse do they have after that? Like you've given them opportunities to rectify these, these issues that we're seeing. And at that time, if you revoke their license, what recourse have they had? Well, I'm, you, I'm, I don't, I mean, we haven't even discussed what the penalty would be. Well, I mean, that's why you, you, you've asked about why my thought process behind the warnings are, and that's what I'm thinking, right. and that's what we're looking at. Okay. Anybody else have any questions? No, thank you. None. So let's go back to the procedure here. So we have heard the testimony, we have asked the questions, and now the board must deliberate and make a finding first without, the finding is not the penalty phase, so just determining whether we, you know, with the pre testimony and the evidence presented, do we believe that the violations, and there were two brought up, the two violations are, Let's go back to that. Um, the two violations are for uh, exceeding the occupancy limits of the bar. Uh, in, in this case, uh, mm -hmm. the allegation is substantially. That it's rated for 99 people. It was estimated, although they didn't do a count, uh, of approximately 200 plus. But the actual count, once the, the fire inspector, Captain Risi, came, was 139, which is still 50% above capacity. Um, and then the second violation on um, the 26th is a uh, section 1.11 illegal activity on the licensed premises by um, the fight occurring and the actual the actual thing is that uh, licensees shall make all reasonable and diligent efforts to ensure that illegal activities do not occur at the licensed premises. Such efforts shall include calling police for assistance as necessary to protect patrons against injury or evict unruly patients or to uncover unlawful conduct or to give medical assistance and providing police with requested information and be uh, there's no, there shall be no disorder or other legal activity on the licensed premises or any premises connected herewith by an interior communication. So according to the chief, the parking lot that it happened in is related in, and purposefully used for the, the bar and therefore it is under the jurisdiction of the license holder to make that a safe area as well. And that was not. So I will open it up to deliberation from 
from the members of the board? Uh, I think in terms of a finding, if there was a violation or no violation, I, to me, I think it's obvious that there were two separate violations, one on the 24th and one on the 26th. I find the same. And I would concur. So there's not a whole lot of deliberation there since I think it's, I think it's pretty obvious that these do. So uh, I will, um, let, let's just take a, somebody make a motion and let's vote on that. Okay. Sure, go ahead. Uh, I move to find that um, JK Waterfront Inc. doing businesses on the rocks uh, violated the liquor license regulations of the town of Lunenburg, section 1.03 and section 1.11 by exceeding the mac maximum occupancy limits and by a fight occurring in the premises and continuing outside the premises. Do I have a second? Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor of those findings and that motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed? None. Three to, three to nothing. Unanimous. So now we go on to the penalty phase. So there are in the regulations uh, guidelines, and they are just that. As they indicate, they are guidelines. It was indicated that this is the first violation. Uh, I would probably state for the record that this is the first violation brought to this, the licensing authority. But as was indicated in the testimony, there have been others that could have been brought that were not. Uh, and I'm just trying to search for that page in here. Set, oh, there we go. Sentencing guidelines under 1.14. So a first offense is a warning to a seven, up to a seven-day suspension. That is what the recommendation is. So, uh, and we have the recommendation from the chief that it be a written warning um, if he would be found in violation, which we have just found. I will open that up about what actions the board would like to take. Sure. Um. Let me go to the junior member, I'm sorry. Sure. Uh, so for the violation section 1.03, the exceeding the maximum occupancy, uh, I think a written warning is more than appropriate for that first violation. Okay. And the second, well, we might as well do, you can go uh, and, uh, You know, for, for the second violation, um, I also think a warning is appropriate there. Um, the close proximity of the incidents, I don't think would have given the um, owner um, sufficient time to implement, implement um, additional measures. Um, and seeing that they're, they're not, uh, one's overcrowding and the other is, is uh, fighting, um, they're slightly um, they're not the same. So um, while based on the video that I viewed, it appeared that the second incident was also a very crowded evening, um, and um, but without a head count, I would just say that you know fighting it occurs, it does occur, and I think uh, based on the other violations that were enumerated by Mr. Jeffries. That appears to be um, an issue that they're having in uh, this uh, recent past. Okay. Mr. Jeffries. I'm in favor of a two-week suspension uh, or more. I think, I think that there's, I think that these violations are egregious. I think that, you know, we're talking about a population for the most, I mean, for the most part, it's a young 20-year-old bar. It's where a lot of people under the age of 30, a lot of people specifically under 25 go. I think this bar has a reputation for over-serving. Um, and despite that reputation, we have police reports that indicate on numerous occasions people being over-served. I think 0.29, there's no question that that's over-serving. Um, I find that some of this, 
I find that the pattern of behavior is outrageous, that there was clearly a conversation that occurred with the chief of police to say, wait a minute, we've had a lot of incidents this year, that there were no attempts to adequately resolve that. While you can't control someone else getting into a fight, what you can control is how many people are in your bar. Um, and there didn't seem to be any controls to do that. Um, you know, this, this bar has been in business for a while, and I understand that this is their first violation, but this first violation comes after a series. And, and I think I would have been at the point of a written warning sometime in May. Um, I probably would have been at the point of a one-week suspension in, in, by September. And at this point, I'm, I'm, I'm at a two-week point. I also want to note that the, the applicant who has the license not being here tonight, while we're not, I don't believe that a penalty is fair for that uh, lack of presence, you know, I do think that it speaks to perhaps the seriousness by which the applicant takes this concern. Um, and, I, and I know that we're at the time of the year where these young 20-year-olds are, are home from vacation. Um, this is, I would expect, to be a high uh, occupancy time of the year. And I think it's fitting that we don't need to have, you know, the 25-year-old crowd and below getting into serious incidents where they have blood and head injuries, uh, where people are called out of their name, uh, racially insensitive comments, um, and then a pattern of over-serving. I think people, when, when parents have their college students go to a bar, that they should reasonably expect that they're going to come home. Um, and I don't think that I have that assurance with On the Rocks. So I'm in favor of a suspension from December the 24th, given that we have to notify by certified mail. Um, December the 24th, Christmas Eve until January the 7th. I'd also be open to go until January the 9th to cover that full weekend. What is the, what is the timeline for appeal? How many days do they get to appeal? I don't see an appeal process in our, excuse me? I don't see an appeal process in our regulations. Oh, it's got to be with the ABCC. Yeah, there they, there they, has, to be, has to be an appeal process. Right, I, I believe, um, I believe there's there is a timeline on that. be in the regulation because it's probably a part of the ABCC. There is an appeal process, obviously. Four to six weeks after the hearing on, their, on the ABCC's website. I see five days. Yeah, that, I, I, was, I thought it was five or ten days. I think that's the notification, right? They have the ability to request an appeal. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. No, that's what I mean. How, how you know, if they request an appeal. Because I think any suspension or any penalty we give, if it, if it requires a suspension, we'd have to, I don't know that we could make it immediate because it would remove their right to appeal. So I think the, I think the suspension would have to be after that has lapsed. Okay. Yeah. Um, I believe it's after notification. Right. After the notification is when the appeal timeline starts. Uh, so, so at this point, I will say that I am, <laughs> I am between my two <laughs> colleagues. <laughs> I do not believe that a warning to me is sufficient given uh, the nature of the violation. And as I said, they're both, they're both serious, but I think the overcrowding one is, is, is something that's easily avoided. You, you may not be able to stop somebody at a, in a place that serves alcohol from getting into a fight. And then it seems like 
the bouncer got them out of the bar and so they didn't protect the environs of the bar which by license they should and that's harder to control but not letting 200 people in when you have a 90 person 99 person limit that's to me that's just straight out negligent I mean and, and it's endangering to the people there and everybody else uh, that on top of the other things that could have been a violation I, I consider those already what you have determined from somebody who sits on the licensing authority those oral warnings are the warnings that they would have needed to correct things I think that there's a, 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 a high hurdle to get and it's seriously taken by the town and seriously taken by the ABCC to get something established for alcohol because of problems associated with it. And I think the onus is on and the responsibility is on the license owner to make sure that the establishment stays within those guidelines. Um, you know, there are other things that are now legal in the state that have incredibly high hurdles that if something like this would happen, they would be stripped away in a second of their ability. So if while I am sympathetic to wanting the business owner to do business I think they need to be equally responsible for the fact that people expect there to be a safe environment to go in as part of the establishment so it's not like I would be revoking their, their ability to do business I would say they didn't take those responsibilities that would keep them open seriously enough so I am for a suspension I am not for a two-week suspension uh, I don't know a number of days I would say whatever it is it would be three to five days and it would need to be over a weekend uh, because there has to be a point made that this is serious that we're taking this seriously and we hope that the license owner takes it seriously I don't want to get to a point where it's like it's it's pushed to the side and then something serious does happen and then we're looking back it's like why did we just you know why did we just give a slap on the wrist so Personally, I would be for like a five-day suspension that included a week, a Friday, Saturday, Sunday. It can be the end or the beginning, uh, but those those days. So those, everybody being up here. Can we specify days of the week? Oh, I mean, I know we can probably specify dates, but can we specify? Yeah, we can. I mean, yeah, we can. We can week? make we can make any determination that we want. Yep. Okay. Yeah, you're open and close. I mean, you can't, like, we could restrict hours, I guess. That's another thing we could do for a period, but that seems to be not even. That is a part of, uh, you can set regulations also. Yes. Part of that. You can reduce their hours um, and openings. Right. Do you have any input, Madam Town Manager, on any of these proceedings? Um, as far as process? Process. Guidelines, you know. I'm asking for your opinion. <laughs> no, I'm not asking for your opinion on, on, you know, on the penalty phase. That's that's up to us. But I'm just saying I just want to make sure that we're in the boundaries of what we can be doing here. Yeah. I mean, I think um, so this will need to be uh, put in writing by Elaine to, and served in writing. Um, so we want to calculate it in that time. So hopefully she could get that done tomorrow. Right. And well, I hope so too. That would be good to get it out tomorrow, so they would mm -hmm. the clock would start. So calculate that into your time frame. Well, again, I'm not going to choose. I'm not going to choose a date until we, and we we don't have to choose the actual dates. I think until we until they get past the. Oh, I guess we could. No, I think you're. Do we have to say what dates yeah, we want to close? It will, okay, it will state the time period okay. that they're. All right, fine. Places. That's fair enough. And so, if we look at the, I mean, so. I, I have one other proposal. Yep. Um, if we were going to go for a suspension of five days or uh, 14 days or longer, up to 21 days, I think, for the second violation, um, I, I would be more in favor of limiting hours to uh, uh, 9 p.m. That way the business, business owner is able to keep their day business because I believe most of these violations based on the record occur after 9 p.m. That's when the ma majority of people go and um, the shenanigans start. And, you know, I'd be more in favor of that. That way. I'm not against that. I, I would say that I would, if, if, if we do that, 
what they're closing to, what is closing time in, in town is it one yeah so I mean so you'd be cutting off four. you know then I would just you know then I'd say a seven day for what period of time I, I'm open to the uh, the period of time but I I think that allows them to uh, operate as well as uh, the uh, servers and, and employees of the restaurant That's don't necessarily fine. lose all that. Uh, Do you know what time uh, they open? Time. I don't have their hours in front of us. They're open for lunch. Are they? I believe. Okay. Get up in the morning. It's oh, yeah. So they're open. Yeah. They're open basically all day. 8 a.m. to 12.45, Monday to Wednesday. 12.45 so a.m. Yeah, I'm much more in favor of limiting and or, or placing moratorium on the hours when the trouble occurs rather than the... I'm with the, you. I, I'm totally with you. I, I can get behind that. Okay. I, I would like to see them closed for a weekend, period. Um, I think that, you know, there's a lot... Of, I mean, if we think about the hoops people have to go through to serve, to sell marijuana, and I mean, let's be real, marijuana isn't, isn't for the most part, killing people the way that alcohol is. Um, you know, it's giving people the munchies. So I think that alcohol is, is inherently dangerous. I think that we have to be responsible in the use of it. I know I, I don't drive when <laughs> that's where I've had some, some alcohol. But I think that it, it has to impact their, their business. And so I, I'm in, I would like to see a combination of the two in which we close them for at least one weekend and then shorten their hours for a period of time. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I'm, I, again, I think that Mr. Dwyer's proposal is a good one because I think it addresses the areas that have the problem. And I probably would venture a guess that the majority of the money the business makes is probably from alcohol sales from 9 to 1 in the morning anyway. Uh, but closing them, remember that there are, I, I don't want to adversely affect people who are employed there who now have one week or whatever we would choose that they don't have an income if they're working there. Uh, whereas I think Mr. Dwyer's uh, solution allows people, you know, they, we, they're not driving by at lunch. There's no 200 people there for lunch. So I think it addresses the problem without, uh, and being business friendly. So I think it does both things that we'd want to do, at least that I, uh, as one member of the board, would like to do. So I would say if we follow that, if we say they close at 9 or 8, then probably more inclined to 8. But then I would just make it a week long, that it's a, it's a week. I'm fine with that. I could get behind that. I, I could support that with the note that I don't, think, I don't think that we have a responsibility to Mr. Ricker's employers. I think he has a responsibility to his employees, that he has a license that comes with rules. And choosing not to follow those rules puts his employees in a position in which they can lose their income. I think that we need to be mindful in a, on, a, on a certain level to that. But my concern is not about our employees going to go a week without pay. It will suck. My concern is the kid who's going to get killed on his way home from getting overserved, or the family that's going to get killed from someone leaving the bar uh, being overserved, especially over the next two weeks, which when people are coming home. So. It, I understand the concern, but it's just not mine. Um, it, it's for the who can be victimized by this. But if we do a one-week suspension for eight, uh, seven days, seven day um, closing at eight o'clock, like I said, I can support it. I would prefer for it to be combined with an additional suspension, uh, but I can support it. I would also note I would like to see. I would like to know in writing from the owner what he is going to do to address the two violations in this as well. So I'd like to know in written form what he plan what is his plan to avoid this violation happening in the future. Well I mean we do have a copy of his alcohol policy but I mean he's not following it. Right. Well that's why I want to know what he I want him to submit something to us and again he has to submit it so that's got to be in there. So before the suspension is over we have to get in writing what his plan is so that we can follow up if we need to. And, and absent that, do we have another hearing or? Uh, 
or do we say it will continue until such a time that he provides it? I would say that it would he has to provide it. We won't, we, we won't reinstitute the hours until he provides the written plan of what he plans to do. I think that you should be able to get that, you know, within the time frame. Mr. Uh, Chief Cannell. Yes, Mr. Alonzo, is it uh, part of this hearing to resume his license is up for renewal? It is. Can't you make that a stipulation on his renewal that in, instead of acting as a penalty phase for that, where I'm not sure that you can continue a suspension without with receiving that documentation. The suspension has to be those certain days because when he appeals it to the ABCC, you, you can't say this is the can't suspension. Yeah, yeah. You, you can't be contingent, but you do have the authority not to renew until those policies are in place or until you get written, written documentation. My understanding is that if we don't renew, then he has to reapply. If you don't renew the license yes and can we renew not. with the contingent he has to provide this I mean that would seem weird that the license renewal is to a penalty for something but but the penalty that I give him can not include the plan that he needs it, to it can but I, I just don't think you can put a stipulation that the suspension continues the suspension has to be whatever your, your whatever your finding is the suspension has to be wow. those dates uh, or you could say the suspension starts whatever date it is and give them that time period to um, get that paperwork and, and just push the suspension dates out to start longer. Just knowing that what the appeal process is going to be and, and how this is going to play out with the ABCC, you, the, um, the process is once you set those dates, those dates are set in stone. Okay. All right. So let's. We'll just say that he needs to submit it, and we'll deal with we'll deal with what happens if he doesn't submit it afterward. I'm not going to hold up the license because that doesn't. I don't even know that we can do that. It's uh, not. It's, it hasn't it's not been part of the rules, right? It's not the rules, mm -hmm. and to make him resubmit to it is seemingly, you know, we're not going to meet next week. So we either approve it tonight or we don't approve it tonight. Mm -hmm. um, and there's got to be for good reason. We can't throw a, a curveball the day of the last meeting and say, oh, no, we're not going to approve it because of this hearing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't, I don't see that as being a supportable defense of denial. I would, I would just urge, Mr. Chair, that since this can be appealed, that, that we discuss renewal separately. Well, we are because, again, this is, the, this is a, a, a violation hearing. So... Um, all right, so when do we want to, so I want to say we need to plan, it just won't extend the, the thing. We, we want to plan written by the end of this, you know, on or before the end of the suspension of what he's going to do to remedy the issues. Um, so what are we looking at as far as? So my, my thoughts on dates were to start on December 31st and run a week from then. Fine with that. <laughs> I'm fine with that. So that would be December 31st to so Friday start Friday including Friday. Friday right right. So it's Friday to Thursday. He'll be open Correct. on the Friday, Thursday. right? Yep. So the 31st to the what sixth. time on the 31st? 8 p.m. Yeah, he's going to have to close from the th on the 31st. He'll have to close every day for the next seven days at 8 p.m. Okay. So that's Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So Thursday is the uh, 6th through, the, through January 6th. Oh, great. You can, you can serve again on Insurrection Day. Uh, so those are the, so do we have enough? Do we need to make that a motion? Yes, we will make that a motion, but do we have enough to write? Yes. The, 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 fi the findings and the penalty of the? Yes. Okay. Based so on the first motion and then this yep. will be the second. So if you want to make a motion, sure. I move that uh, we impose a penalty of a reduction in operating hours for a period of seven days starting on December 31st and running through January 6th 
uh, that the business shall uh, close uh, at 8 p.m. Second. And, and that they will submit a report. And that they will submit a report uh, detailing the um, remedial measures to um, address the recent um, violations. incidents of uh, violations. Next second. Any further discussion? Yes. I do not think this is harsh enough. I don't think this is strong enough. However, I think that we have to compromise to get results, and I think that this is a fair compromise. Appreciate it. Thank you. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? None with Mr. Jeffrey's comment uh, noted. I think we conclude this public uh, violation hearing. Chief, thank you, and thank the officers for coming. Thank you, thank you Chief. Same <laughs> you, yes, you too. <laughs> okay, interviews, appointments, reappointments. So the ratification of the town manager's appointment for the recreation director, Robert Thompson. Yes. So um, as you're aware, the select board ratified the temporary rec director in September for Robert Thompson, and he's been filling this position since then after the departure of our previous recreation director. The position was posted from October to no November, and we received two applications for the position. The other applicant had uh, volunteer experience working for a community park committee in the town that she lived in. Um, so Rob stood out as uh, the best candidate for the position. So his uh, prior experience included working as the recreation supervisor and evening studies coordinator for alternative perspectives in Devons. And prior to that, he worked as the recreation manager for the US Army, Army in Germany, where he supervised a large recreation program that served soldiers and their families. He has a total of 13 years related experience in recreation management. He came highly recommended from his reference checks. He was said to be passionate about recreation a good family guy, and very resourceful when it came to programming. Based on his prior work experience and what he's exhibited in the time he's been here, the DPW director and I both recommend uh, his appointment um, to be ratified. I also met with the Parks Commission last night to get a consensus from them on the appointment, and they did vote, and as you heard tonight from uh, one of the members, it was a three to one vote and um, but her uh, response as she said was not based on him as uh, the applicant it was more about the process and setting up the person for success um, we did discuss that during the meeting and um, as uh, one thing i said is after what we experienced the past year we're highly sensitive to being um, over ambitious in programming and um, the pitfalls that happened this prior year so that's something that um, we're highly aware of and and looking at going forward um, besides that I also said that um, we would meet with the Parks Commission at a future date to talk about process and roles and everything that goes along with it I would say that we've had there are many shared roles where we have a policy making board and an implementation employee uh, over several of our elected bodies and this is one of them and we've had issues that we've had to resolve in the past I hope that we take the public comment very seriously and that you do meet with them and with uh, the DPW director and everybody works together to know what everybody's fear of influence is so that nobody's surprised at all uh, I think having that clear and and to use Ms. Lockwood's phrase of you know setting somebody up for success I couldn't agree more I think you definitely want to make sure that all the parties not just the new employee but you know the town manager and the DPW director and the Parks Commission that everybody knows what everybody else is doing so that this can be done in a seamless way and I, I I'm encouraged to hear you say you are meeting with them I'm not inclined to not vote on this tonight. I'm certainly inclined to do it, but I do want the commitment that that will be discussed with them. Certainly, and I agreed with her comments as well. Excellent. Mm -hmm. 
is is the expectation for the rec director to attend monthly park meetings? Yes, I would expect that would be the expectation that he'd report on everything that's going on okay. in the department. Mm -hmm. So I, I discussed what I'm about to say with you separately to the town manager. I'm going to support the appointment tonight for Rob Thompson. However, um, my support is because the Parks Commission uh, voted three to one to support it. I don't. I question if this is an appointment for the town manager to make and, and for us to ratify. So the authority for this is 4-2D of the town charter, uh, which identifies that positions not otherwise, uh, for which no other method of selection is outlined, uh, that, that, that we follow the process by which the town manager therefore appoints and the select board ratifies. I think that in section 3-9 of our charter, uh, which goes into the responsibilities of the parks commissioners, that they have the authority to appoint, um, est I'm blanking on the first word, but surveyors, clerks, and attendants, excuse me, surveyors, clerks, and other officers, including a police force. Uh, I think that the language in the charter, my read, is that it's, this is the parks commissioner's appointment to make. Uh, however, I recognize that there is some ambiguity and that it could go either way. And so I will support the appointment tonight with the note that, um, that I appreciate the fact that you reached out to the parks commissioners, met with them, uh, discussed this with them. I think that that is what they're looking for. I think that that's what helps make this successful. And I really appreciate you doing that. Uh, and, I, and that's why I will support tonight's appointment. Comment? Parks Commission supports them. Town Manager supports them. I support them. There you go. All right. So I entertain a motion regarding the ratification of the recreational director or the recreation director, not recreational director, recreation director Robert Thompson. So moved. Second. All those in favor of the ratification, please say aye. 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 Opposed? None. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. And now ratification of town manager's appointment for assistant town accountant, Katie Medina. Okay. I'm asking the board to ratify my appointment of Katie Med Medina as the assistant town accountant. And so this position was also posted in October through November. We received multiple applications for this position and we interviewed four qualified um, in, uh, individuals with accounting backgrounds. So Katie currently works for the city of Gardner. She has for the last seven years. And she's currently the assistant treasure collector. And prior to that, she was their budget project manager for their community um, development block grant program. And prior to that, she was their financial administrator. And before her time working for Gardner, she worked as the, an accountant for Haywood Hospital. And um, prior to that, she worked for the town of Winchester as their assistant treasurer. Um, so she also came highly recommended from her reference checks. It was stated by multiple people that she was an amazing person, worked really well with other people, um, got along with everyone, and um, said that they could wish they could still be working with her. So that's always encouraging to hear. Uh, the finance director and I both recommend Katie for this position, and we think she's going to be a great fit for our team. Any questions for the town manager? None. No. Then I would entertain a motion regarding the ratification of the appointment of assistant town accountant Katie Medina. Move to ratify. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? None. Town manager report. Announcement of existing vacancies. There are two vacancies on the Architectural Preservation District Commission, uh, two vacancies on the Economic Development Committee, one regular member vacancy on the Green Communities Committee, and two associate vacancies, one vacant position uh, that must be a resident of Pearlbrook Apartments for the Housing Authority, two vacant positions for citizens at large on the Stormwater Task Force, and one associate vacancy for the Zoning Board of Appeals. Anyone interested can fill out the application forms, uh, which can be found on the town website, and submit them back to 
the select board's office. Didn't we have a housing authority position that was from Pearl Brook, Brook that he wanted to be on? Yes, and uh, he passed away. So that, oh. yeah. Oh, that's position. awful. Yes. So. Oh, I'm um, sorry to hear that. I, I, I thought I remember appointing him within the year. It's terrible. Yes. There is someone interested in um, filling that position, though, and it's on the first meeting in January. So, um, but we're still advertising. Okay. okay. The employment opportunities with, within the town, we have a part-time benefited position for a digital services staff librarian, a part-time position for the assistant to the sewer business, uh, which is the assistant to the sewer business manager, Principal assessor, which is a full-time benefited position, a trash and recycling coordinator, which is a part-time non-benefited uh, paid through a grant position, a part-time non-benefited position as a van driver, and two videographer positions, which are part-time non-benefited. Uh, more information can be found on the town website, which is um, under the employment opportunities. Uh, to find out about those positions. Update on the Ritter and Town Hall building envelope projects after checking with the APDC and the Historical Commission about the historical value of the Ritter shutters, the Town Hall metal ventilator, and the Town Hall chimneys. Both the APDC and Historical Commission agreed that the shutters should not be put back on the Ritter building, the metal ventilator should be removed, and that the chimneys should be restored. Both commissions said that the shutters were, that were on the Ritter should not be put back as they did not exist in the original architectural plan for the building and were put on after 1947. And the metal ventilator was also not part of the original architecture at Town Hall and the chimneys were part of the historic architecture. So these were the three items that needed to be decided before our architect could move forward with the building envelope projects for these two. Um, buildings so and do we need to make it is this on tonight it's not but if there's a consensus I can tell the architect to move forward with those I mean I'm for their mm -hmm. determinations anybody else are you for their determinations or not Not to put them back on. What? So you want to check? Yeah. We're going to pause here because there is a smell of smoke that we are going to check. So hold on one second. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. It is coming outside and it's smelling in here because it's coming in through the vents. So, back to this. Does everybody, is there a consensus that for the Ritter and Town Hall buildings that we, do we agree with the APDC and the Historical Commission about their evaluations about what features should be put or not put on. They're saying that the Ritter building should not have the shutters put back on because they weren't in the original plan and they weren't put on until after 1947 and that the metal ventilator was not part of the original architecture at Town Hall but the chimneys were so they would remove the metal ventilator and 
rebuild the chimney even if it's just a uh, an architectural feature not a working chimney yeah I'm fine with that determination I'm not in agreement about the shutters because I think that you can still modify buildings after they were initially built and they've had those shutters for how many years Since yeah but the, the question was do we put them back on because we don't even know if we have them and they, some of them would have to be rebuilt and it's going to cost extra money so if it wasn't even part of the original building then I'm again I'm fine with that and this is eventually going to go before them anyways because it's a would be because it's in the APDC yeah. it's a, a certificate to alt alt alter yeah. right yes. I don't agree with the shutters, but I agree with the other two. Mr. Dwyer, do you? I agree with the removal of uh, the metal ventilator. I don't know that I agree that the chimney should be restored. When um, do we need to know this by? <laughs> well, our architect is waiting on this information. He retires not too far away, too, so we <laughs> <laughs> want to make sure this gets done before he retires. Uh, and I, I agree that the shutters can be left off. Um, I just don't know that the chimneys are not functional. So at this point, they're decorative. Mm -hmm. it, it seems like, to me, that's, I think we can have a picture of the building that has a chimney and said, look, it used to have a chimney and save the cost of uh, replacing the chimney. Chimneys. Chimneys, yeah. 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 Personal. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to argue that. I mean, again, it'll be the cost, and of course, anything that happens through the roof is a place that a sure. roof can leave. So, I mean, I, I understand that. The more penetrations we have. I don't mind being in the minority in this. I, I'm, yeah. I, I'm for them being put on, but if there are two or against, then yes. I think that you're, I have a you're for the idea. chimneys. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I'm okay with the chimneys being on. Okay, I'm with you on the chimneys. Ah, okay. That the chimney should stay. I had, That's what you're saying, right? Yeah. My but, suggestion yes. would be to tell the architect for the items that the APDC may um, we'd have to go through the process anyways to have them as alternates on the bid. So if they're not included, I'd support yeah. that. I, there Sounds you go. great. Yeah. All right, let's do that. All right. <laughs> chimney and shutters, right? Yeah, everybody agrees that the ventilator should yeah. be off. Yeah. yeah. So yep. we're fine with that. So okay. there should be an alternate for the chimneys and an alternate for the shutters. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Town facilities projects um, and repairs. The electrician that was contracted to do the electrical work in the basement is almost complete. Uh, he has a few remaining lights to put up. Um, to It was very little lighting down there if you've been down there and approximately 200 pounds of old <laughs> wiring was removed this was all non-live dead wiring uh, significantly cleaning up the ceiling areas and addressing the most critical safety components that needed to be addressed there's still a good portion of work left to do that's the it, what is called i guess bx wiring yep and um so that's all live wiring but that would be we'd want to bring that up to code um, and remove that and replace it with what um, is, is up Michael DeVicus doing the work? Is yes. Nice. Good, yep. good. I'm very impressed with this uh, company. And also, um, the next phase would include um, the live phone and cable wiring because that's also um, a complete, you know, it's going to be a lot of troubleshooting because yeah. it's all. Well, it's all a rat's wiring. nest. Yeah. yeah. But if you. Um, I have a couple pictures. I tried to get them in the report, but it, they just weren't sending to my email, right? So I'll send those around. Good. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. 30 School Street landscape design project update. The Google form survey supplied by the architect was put on the town Facebook page and can be located on the town website through the select board's web page. And as of today, he has received 10 responses. So we'll promote that. If everyone fill out the survey that's supposed to be in by the end of this month is it on it's on the town website too right yes so yeah. yes let's get everybody to fill out the google form regarding that the landscape yeah. design project on the old primary school 
And I'll, I can repost it on Facebook to try to generate more. Okay. The working group, uh, which includes the police chief, the fire chief, the DPW director, the land use director, the assistant town manager, and myself are meeting with Ray virtually this Thursday. And the next community meeting will be held on January 18th at 7 p.m. And Ray will present two conceptual designs and their cost estimates at this meeting with a goal to select the preferred concept plan. Okay. Invitation for bids, the public safety building chiller replacement project is currently out to bid and proposals are due January 11th. And a COVID-19 update the, from the Board of Health, the total number of cases reported as of December 11th was 85 and the positivity rate was 10.16%. And like I stated earlier, will be closed on Friday the 24th an observance of Christmas Eve, Monday the 27th, an observance of Christmas Day, and Friday the 31st, an observance of New Year's Day. The Senior Center is gonna be open half a day on um, New Year's Eve for a program they had already had planned, so they'll be open that half day. The uh, Council and Aging Director didn't wanna let everybody down. So I thank her for that. That's all I have. Thank you very much. Any questions for the town manager? Current business approved minutes of November 9th, 2021. Has everybody read those minutes? I wasn't here for that meeting. Let's leave that till next meeting. Because I think there's only two of us. And let's get Lou in on it. Uh, warrants. Ooh, all right. Stack of warrants. Payroll deductions in the amount of $226,092.84. Payroll in the amount of $1,012,867.74. Generally higher than usual. What's going on with payroll? Uh, accounts payable in the amount of $447,300.60. Action items. Any action items? Uh, yes. Um, do we have an update on the status of the rocks across from the senior center? That's a request from the not. Council of Aging. Yeah. I do not have an update on that. Okay. okay. Can we, yeah, mm -hmm. especially since those, the whole point was that we were going to get a determination because they're in the right of way mm -hmm. and DPW director said that they would possibly be an obstruction to plowing. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we really need to make the determination in this. And the determination is that they are, um, according to the survey, they're in the right of way and the property owner has been spoken to twice a letter sent um, from um, <coughs> me Dellerman and costa and the dpw director and i met <coughs> with her on site once and i called her a second time okay and do we have the ability to i mean they're on our right away do we have the ability and the authority to move them and we obviously have the equipment to move them so let's move them mm -hmm. So can we make a determination that we're going to give somebody a deadline and they move them or we'll move them, but they'll be moved? If we move them, though, I mean, we're going to incur some costs that they should be incurring. So I'd also be in favor of exporting those costs. Well, it depends. Uh, let's hear from the DPW director what our options are. Actually, I'd want to speak with council as yeah, well that's about because they're let's not technically our property on our property. But. Okay. Well, things that are in violation of our right of way, you know, if, if, if a piece of equipment that we plow with gets, gets damaged because of these, then, you know, what is our recourse if they're there? So we have to have some authority. I'm always amazed at the town and these kind of things, the, the lack of authority we seem to have on these. But I just like to be across all the... No, I, wanna, I want to, too. But it's a little part Are you getting car. up? Do you have a comment? Do you want me to address it? Sure. Yes. 
No, I'm curious as to how this is different than someone like parking a car in the middle of a right away. That would be a like a traffic <laughs> moving violation. Uh, so uh, these are these are the boulders, yes. yeah. correct? Yeah, it's been a little while since we talked evening. about them. Good evening. Good evening. How are you? I'm <laughs> Adam Cross, the town council. Uh, so, uh, so I'm familiar with the matter. Uh, it's been I don't know, maybe a year, uh, maybe not quite a year since mm -hmm. we last discussed it, but uh, six months maybe. Yeah. Um, and uh, we had drafted and prepared and served a letter indicating that these needed to be removed. That's typically the first step in the process. If something isn't removed from town property, you have a couple of options. Uh, one is a self-help remedy, which would essentially be take whatever item is encroaching onto town property uh, and remove it. And generally, you're liable if you cause damage to it, as silly as that may sound. Um, you can replace it, or excuse me, you can place it onto adjacent property. So if it's a circumstance where uh, there's a boulder that's a few feet onto your property, you could pick up the boulder and move it a few feet so it's on the private property if there are room to do that. Uh, if there's not room to do that, then you have to place it in a location where uh, you can store it until such time as there's some form of order indicating what happens with that personal property, which is not your property. It just happens to be encroaching on your your public right of way. Um, the other option would be, of course, not engage in self-help and file suit in a, a court, a court of appropriate jurisdiction, and seek a court order requiring that the items be moved or giving you express permission to do something other than simply move them a few feet onto the private property, remove them, dispose of them, whatever the court would authorize. Um, I tend to discourage self-help, but that's not to say that it's not an option, and I certainly appreciate that in a circumstance like this, it's you know, arguably, not arguably, it is more costly for the town to engage in litigation, be a filing fee, you know, no no direct legal cost to you in terms of, you know, hourly or anything of that sort, but there's there's a, there's court yep. costs involved, yep. and so so I get that. Um, but those are the two options that the, the town yeah, I'm, I'm, I am all for let's engage with the property owner and let's come to an agreement and everybody shakes hands or does whatever they do and then something happens. But what we keep, you know, well, in this instance, it's going on for a year, you know, I, I think it's, it's I, I realize in the, in the world of litigation, a year is like a nanosecond, uh, <laughs> especially in our, our country. But, you know, we, we should be able to get, I just want to see things moving. Because it seems like the property owner is not interested in working with us to move the items. Well, that's the challenge, and it, it's not, it's arisen in other circumstances too, not just concerning encroachments where you attempt to engage a, a taxpayer or a resident and uh, with the intention of doing things the right way, but it takes two parties to, to engage and have that conversation, that dialogue, and rectify the situation. And if you don't get the cooperation from the other party, typically your options are, in most instances, either self help, which Again, in, in, in many circumstances, I wouldn't recommend this is one of these where maybe we would have that conversation or engage the courts. Uh, I would like to think that engaging the courts, this wouldn't be a circumstance where we're buying into years of litigation. I would like to think it's one of those instances where we would file a complaint really for the sole purpose of bringing it together with a request for a preliminary injunction, and we would ask the court for immediate relief. Probably not ex parte. You'd probably be required to provide notice to the property owner so that she could be present. Um, but I'm, I'm thinking matter a matter of weeks as opposed to a matter of months or years. I'm heavily leaning in that direction. This is not a determination that we have met, got to that direction, but we will, you know, I think we'll put it on an agenda item going forward. Okay. Great. Thank you. Any other action items? Yes. Um, do we have the survey results back from the um, conservation land on Townsend Harbor? Yes. Yes, and that was the DPW director. If you can just email them, that would be good. Yeah. All right, and then we can follow up um, at our next meeting about that. And then I have a request. Uh, I was reading through our rules and regulations, and one of the things that I read was that um, there's an expectation that we're going to meet with the boards that we appoint quarterly. Is that something that, is that a, and I, I don't have the policy specifically in front of me, is that something, uh, and this is to you, Mr. Alonzo, is that, would you recommend that we prior to going into the appointment season uh, next year that we meet with any of the boards that we appoint just for an update? This comes up a lot about you know trying to meet with people more regularly, but people's schedules being what they are, it's very difficult. And 
I'm not I'm on its face I'm not against it it's just as a matter of practicality it doesn't happen uh, I'd love to meet with everybody make sure everything's going well but it takes time and it takes people's effort to even coordinate such a meeting because we're dealing with generally five people on this board and then however many people is on the appointed board and what can be done so so in principle I'm for it but we haven't really adopted it in any regular way and we, we have met with we have met with board you know boards committees and appointed bodies when there have been issues to resolve so those it's more of the squeaky wheel policy than anything is it possible just to ask uh, the boards that we appoint not necessarily like one meeting of the chairs but just to ask a representative to find the time the next two months just to give us an update before sure. we go into town we can send an email to them sure okay yep so they should send an emissary is what you're saying <laughs> All right. Thank you. I have one. I, I've talked to the town manager about this, uh, and it came up last last week. Uh, that now that we have an assistant town manager, I have requested that in any meeting where the town manager's absence is known, vacations or things of that nature, that town the assistant town manager is be you know be available here at these meetings to be in her place, not necessarily to be you know not to be peppered with questions but just to be focused on any specific items at hand that she can be versed in um, I think it's just helpful in that regard especially since we're still doing zoom meetings that that alone is helpful and the way COVID is going I don't see any any elimination of zoom meetings anytime soon so I think those two things would be helpful I don't know what rest of the board might think about that but that is a request I agree I agree okay committee reports mr. Dwyer the stormwater task force met last uh, Thursday December 16th uh, we had a good meeting uh, we discussed uh, a number of things uh, one was uh, the inputs that we got from uh, uh, town manager as well as the DPW director and the land use director um, we also discussed um, what it would take to establish a uh, enterprise fund for stormwater. Uh, currently, DPW handles most of our stormwater tasks, cleaning catch basins and, and things of that nature. But all, all of that budget is implicit within, within the uh, DPW omnibus budget. Uh, so one of the things that we want to look to is, is how do we better track moving forward, you know, what portion of that omnibus budget is budget is actually going towards uh, uh, stormwater. So in the future, um, because the pro what prompted the, the task force was the expansion of the MS4 permit by the EPA and unfunded mandate. So if as that, we don't think the stormwater management is going to get lesser as we go on. We think it's going to continue and possibly get strengthened. So we want to have a way to, as these uh, uh, increased requirements may occur, track them and then be able to you know bring it forward and say okay you know we have this we need an increase in, in this enterprise fund before we do that we need to know what we're spending um, so uh, we one of the things we talked about is, is having the task force come before this board uh, in, in mid-February like our 15th February 15th meeting if we can put it on the agenda just to talk to the board about you know the things we're, we're uh, uh, looking at in the stormwater task force and, and, and some of the things that we want the, the help and, and blessing in this board for him. sure cool mr. Jeffries any committee report yeah just to follow up on the library uh, I mentioned last meeting that that the library trustees were re creating the report or the annual evaluation for mirror and they approved it at the last meeting uh, those are kind of the highlights the library um, yeah they met last Wednesday okay and capital planning met right before this meeting so we have 31 items on our list that we did our basically we all tallied priorities and then we averaged out those priorities between people so we have the, the first draft done we will meet again on uh, the fourth correct the fourth yes to p potentially and uh, I don't want to look back at the town manager but probably she wants us to complete them on the fourth 
<laughs> so, uh, but anyway, that's that's our goal is to to complete that prioritization on the fourth. So everybody in the committee will be reviewing what we did. They got emailed to us already, and so we'll have a couple of weeks to review it and do any fine tweaks. Nobody, not nothing in the item list is going to go up or down appreciably from tonight. It may be tweaked up a, a position or two or down. Uh, and then we'll submit that as the report that the town manager will use for the budget. And uh, that's all I have for committee reports. Old business, notice of, of right of first refusal for chapter 61 uh, property, which is the 490 Chase Road. This has been continued from last week because we wanted the open space committee to meet and they did last Wednesday or Thursday. Uh, and That's Tuesday, I think. I think they were meeting the same night. Okay. So. Anyway, they have. Uh, they think the they see no reason to make any uh, attempt to get this property, and that we should, you know, we should waive our right of first refusal for the the two acres, two point almost three acres, being taken out of that Pierce Tree Farm property to be assigned to one of the uh, primary residences there. Are you looking for a motion? Mr. Yes. Mr. Yes. Um, I move to waive our first right of refusal uh, for property located at 490 Chase Road. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Is this the only place I'm signing right here? Okay, request to post for 2018 eighth grade Super Bowl championship signs. Now, have we contacted the Bengals? Because this has been on and I've yes. asked. Yes, mm -hmm. okay. And what? They were uh, told it was going to be back on the agenda tonight. Okay. Uh, I, I am going to say that at this point, since it's a 2018 uh, request, uh, you know, nobody's coming here to push this forward except in a written request. And our own DPW director is not inclined to have this approved. Um, putting up signs. And I think this also, we, we need to, this highlights the fact that we need to maybe modify our policies for these kind of signs that they have a certain age out limit so if we do something that commemorates some kind of championship that if we do put them up they're put up for x amount of years and they don't just start you know working their way up or down the, the poles going in so that we can do that uh, but anyway that's not why that's again since somebody's coming here to push this i, I think we're just going to take it off the uh, we're not going to vote on it we're just going to take it off the agenda No objection. <laughs> okay. Now, wouldn't be December without some more license renewals. Uh, I have a question, Mr. Chair, as we go into license sure. renewals. Because we have three members here tonight, yep. um, are our rules, uh, because we are technically a five-member board, that approvals need three votes, or is it of the members present? My understanding is members present. Yes, that's what my understanding is as well. Okay. We need a quorum to have an official meeting, and uh, you know, we need uh, only in certain boards like Z ZBA or planning board it has. There are certain restrictions that have to do with the total seated membership, but in our board for these, it's just a majority of the quorum that's present. Okay, thank you. But to make it easier, I hope we don't have any split votes. Let's put it that way. We will. We will. Okay. All right. So now I'm eager to get into this now. <laughs> All right. So we have the remaining uh, alcohol licenses. Uh, these are the four that we can approve tonight. Is that correct? Lakeview, Asian Imperial Donnelly's. On the rocks. I spoke to uh, Elaine for clarification earlier. There's a safety inspection that's going to happen next week for Smoke Snack, Dario's, and Extapa. Um, and I believe it's scheduled for the 29th. 29th. 
28. 28. It's on here. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's right. Who says it? <laughs> so I, I think that the hope is that we will approve these um, pending uh, positive approval of those inspections. <sighs> I'm going to go against my Grinch tie of the evening because my usual case in this is that these come up regularly every year. And there was a time when we would do a lot of, we'll approve these contingent on them getting in on time, okay? I don't usually do that. I'll do it tonight, it's a newer board, and you know what, in, in, in the craziness that is COVID, I'll, uh, uh, but I'm not really a big fan. We notified that Elaine has been on this since November. They should have been able to get these inspections. They know they're coming up. These are not surprise inspections. And I'm really not a fan of, okay, we'll let them get to the 29th. And then it's kind of on us that we have to make sure that somebody's available to give it to them when they bring it in. So I don't think I could have been more clear to, you know, Extapa last week. But. And Elaine actually starts in September. Yeah. Notifying. But if the, if the rest of the board is fine with doing contingent for these three, uh, I'm fine with it. Well, I ask what the impact is of us not doing a contingent. And the impact is, since the end of the year, uh, they will have to start, they'll basically lose their alcohol license. Right. They'll have to start the process all over again. So it forces us between a rock and a hard space, because again, we're making decisions about someone else's business, rather than them making a decision about what they need to do to keep their business operating, which is not a position that I think we should be in. Um, so I'm more inclined to say, sorry, Smokestack, Dario's, and Extapa, but looks like you have to go through AP, ABCC all over again. Um, and next time that this happens, I promise that they will not be at December 20-something trying to get their license renewed, that they will do what other responsible businesses do and say, I'm going to make how much money by having this license? Let me make sure I get this taken care of. But I, I understand what you're saying, and I'll support the majority of the board. <laughs> Do you have an opinion one way or another? The procrastination irritates me, but it doesn't irritate me to the point where I want to deny the license. All right. Okay. I will make a Christmas miracle exception <laughs> that, that I will, I, I, I generally don't, and I'm going to do it even though in past years I was really against it. Because again, these are known, like January 2nd, they know that in December they need to do this. So they have like 11 months to prepare for this. Let's say nobody's gonna do it 11 months, but they know from September, that's three whole months that they have to get the, all this stuff in. And it's the same stuff every year. It's not like we give them, a, they have to wait till September to see what the surprise packet is. What do they have to provide this year? It's the same stuff every year. I, okay. I, I tend to take a more charitable view um, you know, for example, I don't always get my car inspected within the month it's supposed to be inspected. Sometimes I get it on the first of the following month, and you know. Yeah, I it, do it three, it, four months later. It, <laughs> <laughs> yes, but you're also not making like you, like Mr. Jeffrey said. You're not your business isn't required. You know, isn't contingent on having this license or a big part of your business. Now, these are all restaurants that do other things, so it wouldn't be, you know, incredible. But it. It obviously is problematic for them not to have one if they advertise that they do. Yeah. Okay, um, at least it'll be said that we didn't stop them and if they don't get it in on time, then it's out of our hands and they'll have to reapply. <clears throat> so, uh, alcohol renewals, 449 Corporation doing business as Lakeview Club, 449 Whalem Road, an on-prem all alcohol license. Uh, Zhang Jun Lu Inc. doing business as Asian Imperial at Five Electric Ave, a restaurant all alcohol license. Donnelly's Tavern Inc. doing business as Donnelly's Tavern, 43 Summer Street, restaurant all alcohol license. And JK Waterfront Inc. doing business as On the Rocks, 96 Lakefront Avenue, restaurant all alcohol license. I'd like to pull On the Rocks and vote on them separately. All right, so let, well, can we vote on the other three? Yes. Okay, so we're going to be voting on the Lakeview Club, Asian Imperial, Donnelly's Tavern, 
for their all, all alcohol, two all restaurant all alcohol and one on premise all alcohol. So I have a motion regarding those three. I move to approve. Second. All those, any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, nay. Anybody against? It is unanimous. Okay, now, uh, taking separately at Mr. Jeffrey's request, JK Waterfront Inc. doing businesses on the rocks, 96 Lakefront Ave, restaurant all alcohol license. I move to approve. So, second. Okay, any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Okay. Is there any reason? Yeah, I, I, I have a lot of issue with some of the comments that I read in those police reports about the multiple issues. You know, um, you know, I think that they're pretty serious having a hearing and for the owner of the business to not even show up, to not even show up. And then we're going to renew a license for him. If he doesn't take his business serious, I'm not going to take it serious for him. So I'm, I'm not in favor of it, but it is what it is. Okay. Okay, now, uh, these remaining three would be approved contingent upon them uh, providing their elect alarm inspections, which are scheduled for December 28th for all three of them. They are Smokestack Roasters LLC doing business as Smokestack Roasters. Uh, Melendez Magana Inc. doing business as Dario's, 310 Massachusetts Ave. I'm sorry, Smokesback Roasters is 39 Massachusetts Ave. Uh, Red Pepper Inc. doing business as Ixtapa Cantina, 308 Massachusetts Ave. Uh, and that's all three of them. Two of them are restaurant all alcohol, that's Dario's and Ixtapa. Smokestack Roasters is a restaurant wine and malt only. So I'd entertain a motion with that contingency put in the motion, please. I move to approve the renewals for uh, Smokestack Roasters, Dario's, and Extapa Cantina with the uh, contingent on the completed alarm inspections, which are scheduled for December 28th. Any further discussion? Yes. yes. Uh, just, I just want to state uh, for the businesses, you know, these safety inspections are a verification that in the event of an emergency, that their patrons can safely get out of the, the restaurant and be made aware of an issue. I think that part of doing business is I understand that things fall by the wayside. Safety to me is just not one of them. Um, you know, if you're conducting business in town and you're and you're and it's profitable and you're making and you're making money, I think you also have a responsibility to make sure that people aren't going to potentially die or get seriously injured by going to your establishment. And and I think that there should be a seriousness. You know, we don't ask for a lot. We don't ask people for a lot of stuff um, to ha to conduct business. And to me. This should not be something that's an oversight. This should not be something that's an end of the year because the town says so. This should be part of their natural culture of doing what's in the best interest of their employees and what's in the best interest of their patrons. Uh, so I'm going to support it tonight because I will support the majority of the board. But I, I take issue with the fact that I even have to. Agreed, and it's not even a town requirement. I think it's ABCC requirement that we the alarm inspections, right? It's a um, building code, I think. Right, right. So, any you know, anybody that has any of these licenses needs inspections. Even even without the alcohol, it'd be just like common vix. The, the if you have somebody on premise, you need to make sure the premise is safe. So, so I agree with you, Mr. Jeffries. And like I said, I don't normally. This is an off year, so. Uh, again, I, people are suffering with a lot of stuff, and I'm willing to take that into account. Okay, all those in favor of those con those approvals with the contingency of the alarm inspections, please say aye. 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 Opposed? None. Common Vic license. Uh, J.K. Waterfront Inc. on the rocks, doing businesses on the rocks, 96 Lakefront Avenue. Entertain a motion on that. Move to approve. I have a second. Second. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, aye. So there's two to one. Okay. And miscellaneous. Ah, I have a split vote coming up in my mind again. 
JK Waterfront Inc. doing businesses on the rocks, 96 Lakefront Avenue for a jukebox license. Move to approve. Second. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. All right. Two to one again. All right. So we'll have the uh, signing ceremony at the end of the meeting. Right. Right. I'm opposed. He's opposed. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's a, he I said aye to, to my request if there's anybody opposed. <laughs> he said aye to opposed. <clears throat> All right. So we don't forget that. We have to sign those. Uh, continue discussion on the TCP Building Design Committee charge. <laughs> so, did anybody provide any language? Thank you. I, here's mine. Okay, do you want to introduce yours, Mr. Jeffries, and you can, and then I'll introduce mine, and then we can talk sure. about both of them? Um, sure, if I can just contrast to the original language that we have in our, the charge that we prepared. Um, so under our charge, it says the Lunenburg T.C. Passiels Building Design Committee will work with the contracted architectural engineering firm to review space needs for town offices, school uses, and community space at the building and or land known as the T.C. Passiels located at 1079 Massachusetts Avenue. That is current. That is what it currently is, yes. Okay. So what I propose is changing to read the Lunenburg Municipal Building Design Committee uh, will review space needs for town offices, school uses, and community space at the building and land, at the buildings and land known as Town Hall, the Ritter Building, and the T.C. Passios, I see a typo, uh, for the purpose of consolidating municipal uses and preserving historic structures. The, the municipal design, excuse me, the municipal building design committee will prepare viable cost effective solutions to the select board. The total project cost cannot exceed, and I, I, we need to insert a number, but for the purpose of discussion, I inserted 22 million. Okay, do we want to discuss each of these individually or should I introduce mine and then we can discuss both of them? Why don't you introduce yours, Mr. Chair? Yeah, sure. So mine uh, is, well, all I've done is added a, 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 a sentence at the end. I've removed the location. I've kept it as a TC building design committee because we already have the committee. So mine reads, the Lunenburg TC Passios design, building design committee will continue to work with the contracted architectural and engineering firms as they become available to review space needs for town offices, school uses, and community space at the building and or land known as the TC Passios. Additionally, the committee will work to prioritize and or rank the existing space usage requests and explore a variety of design permutations at different estimated budget tiers that would meet the needs of the town according to those priorities. The committee is free to analyze, discuss, and investigate other town-owned buildings and properties in their recommendations as they deem necessary to fulfill this charge. So, hmm. not, I mean, uh, uh, there are some things in Mr. Jeffries that I like, and there are some things that I put in mind. I, I think the overarching thing is that we want it to be open. The one thing that I see in Mr. Jeffries that I said last week that I, I can't get behind is putting a cap on a budget because we don't even know. I, I'd rather get something that tells us what our need, kind of like we do the capital plan, something that tells us what our needs are, and then we see, okay, well, how far down that list can we get, and what does a building like that look like? You know, that's the only, the only difference. Otherwise, I'm fine with either. Personally, uh, I like the incorporation of a cap because uh, I know myself, um, I have a hard time uh, separating needs and wants unless I have some sort of uh, a cap to do. Like, you know, I really need that new car, but I don't need to spend, you know, $50,000 on a new car. So, you know, having that budget, I think, informs the committee, you know, the range that they want to work in and the order of magnitude that they want to work in. Um, so I like that. Um, I also like uh, renaming the committee to the Lunenburg Municipal Building Design Committee. I like that a lot. I agree with that. Um, uh, I, I very much like the, the way you worded um, that you work to prioritize and rank. So I, 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 I 
like to blend the two. Yeah. Yeah. I like um, what you have, Tom. I don't, I, the only thing I would change is the name. Yep. I, I, I'm fine with changing the name. I saw your name, and I'm like, yeah, it makes sense. Yep. Absolutely. Just, and then I would just add in um, somehow we need it. I would somehow I, I don't know if we need to put the language preserving historic structures because it's inherent that we have to preserve the historic right, structures. Right, because it's part of the APDC. I agree <laughs> with that. Um, we're going we're gonna to be faced with that regardless, right? Yeah. Um, it's clear that we're appointing them, they report back to us. It may not be necessary to note that they need to provide us with cost-effective solutions, but maybe I think it's helpful to have the phrase cost-effective solutions in here, uh, as well as a total project cost. So how do you recommend blending that those last? Well, I, can, I, I can take a shot at blending them together. Uh, <clears throat> I, I, I'm just, I'm really, I, I am very, I mean, I'm fine with everything else. I'm just really stuck on the budget thing. In your example, Mr. Dwyer, I would say that when you said, oh, you know, I need a car, but do I need this car or that car? Well, that's, so you've identified the need, and then which one you choose is like, that's a, that's a cost issue. But you didn't go out saying, okay, I got Twenty-five thousand dollars. I have forty. Well, nowadays, forty thousand dollars to spend on a car. So I'm just going to find a car that's close to forty thousand dollars. Well, why don't we just look to the last iteration of this committee? We needed to renovate the TC Passios, but we didn't need to renovate it for thirty million dollars. Right. So I mean, I think putting that in there immediately informs the committee that you know, up to this, if it, I mean. I, I I understand your point in terms of you know why why limit ourselves to that, but my, my concern is that if we don't limit our, our budget into the because the budget take dictates the scope that you can look at. Right, but but so does so does the cost of building materials, which are wildly you know they're just all over the place in the last year. Now they I mean they're stabilizing or you know I don't know I don't think we're going to see the. The numbers that we got for the special town meeting, I don't think we would see those numbers. Well, nobody knows where COVID's going, where supply chains are going, but there's every possibility that it's not going to be near that and there will be more in between. It won't go back maybe to what it was, but it won't stay at the high. So that, that also informs the cost without changing the need. So the cost of something can go up and down, but it does, the need for the town doesn't change. I think it has to do with process. Um, so, you know, when you when we go through like the schematic design phase process, we come up with a concept and then we get, figure out a cost for it at the end of that process. And then when we're in the design development phase, which is what we were kind of what we were in for the the primary building uh, or the the renovation, you go through that process. But again, you don't get that cost estimate till the end. I think that by incorporating the language that what it does is, is it will force us then we're going to have to spend more on both schematic design and design development because I think we're going to have to embed cost analysis into the process. So that way when we come up with an idea or a thought it is how much more does this cost? I need you to do some numbers on what this cost. And I think that that, that type of interaction is not how the architects like to work. They like to have that as a final thing. So I think that we have, if we have a number in there, I think it helps so the I, process. So I guess what would be helpful to me is to determine what that number is. Like, yes. So if you say not to exceed and it's some exorbitant number, then it's really not to exceed anything. Because if you put it too low, then it's like, okay, well, you're not going to get anything from for this. So, I mean, so it depends on what the number is. Well, I think we have... And how do we get to that number? Is it, you know... You just put your finger up in the wind and like, okay, that's the number. I think we have time to figure out what that number ceiling may be, but I think that we we already know from the analysis that was already done of, you know, if we put forward a building for, you know, $28 million, that we're going to exceed our budget limits and it's going to restrict what else we can borrow. So I think if we make an assumption that we're going to need to spend a certain dollar amount and stay well comfortably below that so that way we don't hit our, our limits, that number, I think, is going to be how about somewhere this? How about, how about this? Is this possible? Because one of the things that happened with certainly the new build when it came in at like $39 million or something, yeah. uh, and, and Mr. Beardmore is here, but he, he basically 
did the numbers as they came in at the last minute and worked them against our financial policies and it just didn't make prudent sense to go forward because we would be outside of the bounds of our policy. So we could say instead of giving a number that whatever project is has to keep the town within our existing f fiscal policies. I think we can do that, but then we have to provide some more information about what else we plan to spend money on. Well, I think we know. I think we know the big project. The one bi other big project out there is, you know, this in seven or eight years, you know, the TC, the, the, the Turkey Hill School. But, but it looks like we're going to have a park as well across the way here. There might be some monies needed for um, the the park that the Parks Commission. I'm blanking on the name of it, of course. Marshall Park. Marshall Park. Marshall Park. Yeah. Uh, there's going to be monies needed for that. So there there probably is a a, a cushion that we need to keep. You know. That sure, but I'm I'm oh, and I understand, and so I I see where you're going. I'm I'm happy to do that and just say we have to keep you know X percentage below. You know. so, so isn't it easier to estimate what that number is now and just put it in there rather than have them go and do the math to figure out what that is? I mean, I, I so, so we have some pretty smart people who are on the finance committee who could probably say, you know, it's probably on the order of 22 or 23 million and give us that number that we can include here. So that way we know exactly your point, that we're staying within the, the guidelines of our fiscal policy. I'd rather that number come from the town manager because I think that finances has a very limited scope of duties and general financial policy is, is on all of us. Well, I'd like it to be a consensus, no matter what. But a consensus. In a second, yeah. yep. But yeah. I think that is, it, I mean, maybe what we, how, how we can plug a number in here or get an idea is if, if Heather does some analysis with our consultants and I plugs in some assumptions about you know maxing out what you think that's going to cost and marsh is going to cost and whatever else is going to break that we're going to need somehow a big influx of money for and then what will keep us below that uh, with our current policy mr beardmore as you come up to the front i want to thank you for your kind email and your oh, holiday you. wishes that was very nice and very kind very welcome Happy holidays. And I, and I echo those sentiments in working with you and your committee. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to comment on this outside of public comment. Um, I, I agree entirely with Mr. Jeffrey's approach on this and, and his thinking. Um, I don't think that that $22 million number was pulled out of a hat. I, I understand the reasoning behind it. Um, but he's right. There are potential projects pending like the 30 school street project like the uh, marshall park project i almost blanked on the name <laughs> and uh, obviously turkey hill that need to be put into the proper context within the within the financial policy that that we have and and i do think that there's a way that um, the town manager together with our financial consultants can give us the makings of a financial roadmap that can provide some sort of overlay or guardrails for the building committee to operate within. Um, so I, I don't think that any of us in the room tonight can come up with a number throwing at a dartboard and say it should be $22 million or whatever, but I think that there's probably a benchmark that you folks could establish this evening that says by the end of January or by the middle of February or whatever, that we're going to be back here with an agreed upon financial roadmap and and then the committee can can move forward within those within those bounds um but i i you know the, the whole marshall park thing to be honest with you really kind of scares me because it seems like that that is like a, a wild card in the whole thing and and you know frankly i think that we need to put some guardrails around that one too while we're at it um, but specific to this this will give us some time to do the homework that we need to do and and you know, to your point, Mr. Alonzo, around the outcome, my thinking on this is exactly your thinking in terms of how do we get to a positive outcome. And, and one of the themes that I've heard recurring over the course of the last several months is, you know, well, the, the town's going to, you know, propose something that is not necessarily within the financial capacity of the town or the taxpayers to, to, uh, uh, to, to bear, and they're just going to go and build whatever the heck they want. Right? 
this gives us the opportunity to kind of set the message from the onset, right? Which is we're doing this within a financial plan that the select board, perhaps the finance committee, the town manager, and the financial consultants all agree from day one is prudent. And we're gonna stay within those guardrails and come up with a solution that might not be perfect, but it's the best we can do with the resources that we have available. In so far, thank you. And in so far as it, it gathers more support for the potential project, I am for it. That, I will just say that. Good. I'm glad to hear that. Thank you very much. I appreciate Thank your you. time. All right. So how about I take a shot at doing this blended thing? And I think to, to Mr. Beardmore's point, we can put something in here that we say a budget to be determined by the end of January 2021, uh, 2022. How about that? I think that's ambitious if you want to include <laughs> estimates for both the old primary school and the Marshall Park because the old primary school project is complete by May 1st. The Marshall Park project is May. I, uh, I uh, well, counter, counter what I just <laughs> said. Well, what, when can you do it by then? I just want to, those timelines out there, we won't, we will probably, we'll have the two conceptual plan estimates by mid-January. We'll have <coughs> our um, last meeting with Ray the second meeting in February. So we'll have that number pretty much pinned down. But, um, but I can't, I can't, well, aside from the, you know, if, if we ever get to that point where we're, we're removing the, the old primary school, um, the numbers that, that, that Mr. Beardmore presented at town meeting and at the finance committee that showed that we were going over our financial policy was with a $39 million project. I, I think nobody was, had any uh, appetite for even discussing that, and that put us just over like three years was, or four years. It was both the 29 and the 39. The no, 29. The, thir the 29, the, tw the, the 29 didn't put us over. It, 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 one year, yeah. one year, I think. Um, so, again, so we know, and these these other projects. I mean, I don't, I can't speak for Marshall Park because that's brand new, and I don't know what they're looking at, but. The, the 30 school street is not going to be a huge well, number and, and project from the tc pasios committee we have a demo cost on pasios it's going to be similar at 30 school street right the, the demo and and remediation of uh, uh yeah. materials in that school so i want i don't want you know i want the charge to get to the committee so they can get started yes. and if we if we choose an arbitrary number then we choose an arbitrary number, but I don't want to, I don't want to dangle that they can't start because we're not giving them a number because it's going to take two months or three months to get them a number either. Because then, I mean, if we put an arbitrary number in there to be updated by the town manager yeah. upon, you know, yeah, yeah, I'm with you on that. Yeah, I mean, yeah. By the time things start getting going, and we don't have any funding to even work with the architect or engineer right now. Okay. Fine. So by the time we get to that point, we'll have a right number, and so we can update it. So it's, you know, we just yeah. put it in pencil. <laughs> so at the end of Mr. Jeffrey's piece, it says the total project cost cannot exceed blank, which may be amended from time to time. <laughs> right? <laughs> well, that's the, that's the language yeah. you would use. I mean, that's just generic language, right? That means we can, we can always update them on what the cost, you know, what it is. Yeah. Uh, lower or high or whatever. My guess is lower. But <laughs> But you don't know unless we start out somewhere. Unless we change our policy. Yeah. I, no, there's not going to be any appetite. Well, certainly, there's not going to be any appetite for me to change upward our fiscal policy. I'm with you. <laughs> so that ain't going to happen. <laughs> I think they're very prudent and they're very practical, uh, and they're you know they're responsible policies. I I agree. I but I do think it, I'm, as a side comment, I think it would be helpful to remind ourselves and the community why we picked these numbers. I mean, I remember the discussions, but it would, I think that would be a helpful reminder. Why is 11% the number we're going with and not 12 or 11 and a half or 10? Well, in the end, the, the difference between those two numbers is arbitrary, <laughs> you know, 11 or 12. I mean, there's not like, oh, because we looked it up in the, uh, you know, the. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? Like, just to, just to, you know, put some meat on those uh, numbers. Well, we just need to show that 
what we need is a, I, I agree with Mr. Beerborn, the roadmap. We already have one with some of the projects. The town managers worked on one. And if we put some placeholders in uh, for, again, the 30 school street, uh, Marshall Park, we're not going to know. But, you know, Marshall Park is also something that is delayable per se because it, there's no programming going on there now. I'm not suggesting that we be against it because without even knowing about it. But on point is, like, when Turkey Hill needs to be redone, that's a school, and schools have a certain urgency because you need a school. Uh, we, you know, Marshall Park has been kept in, you know, has been allowed to um, grow over and, and go out of use from what it was in its heyday many decades ago over time. So to bring it back, we can delay that. That's really within our purview to do. Uh, whereas some of the buildings, like doing something to this building or, or you know, Casey Passios, we have to know what we're doing with those. Mm -hmm. Two things I want to bring up while yes. we're on this agenda topic that I probably should have mentioned in our, my town manager's report. Just the urgency of doing something about the buildings. Uh, so over the weekend, we had a bird in the building. And which, th this building? This building, okay. which uh, defecated in upstairs, and then um, it we found a dead bird on Monday. So that was a mess to, for, to clean up. Okay. So just a detriment to this building. Um, PAC, I spoke with the chairman of PAC today. Um, they're very concerned just about the, they've been, um, holding off on studio space for years and years in the hopes that something would happen at TCP. There's really no other town space for them to create a studio in. Um, like if it, it was discussed about this building being a packed studio, but this, is, this would be way too costly for them to upgrade. They need basically a raw, unfinished space that the, they can soundproof, put all their studio equipment in um, this building, we obviously know you can't walk in a room without there being <laughs> hearing everyone's footsteps. Or you know, it's just not right. adaptable. Um, so they um, have the money, you know, in their enterprise account specific for the studio that they've been holding off for years. Yeah, for several years. For yeah. So that's another. Just wanted to bring that up as a point of urgency. Are they looking into options? They, there are no options. Yes, that's me the problem. If there were, what there were for options, like the, there are no. Op I mean, the Brooks House is the only other unoccupied. Yeah, but yeah, but space, that's, that's just, just as creaky as this. It, right. Yeah, there's not. That's, you can't put a sound studio. In we're there. a capacity at all of our other spaces. There's no other town buildings that they could. Right. And for them to construct a building, they wouldn't have enough money to do that. So, so, mm -hmm. okay. And I think those are, yeah, those are good points. To I just wanted to bring it up. Know. I especially like the Alfred Hitchcock reference of the, the birds attack here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I will send this around, and then we can get Lou's take on it as well. Okay. Uh, Okay, uh, that, that workshop, uh, FY22 Select Board, wow, why is, this all, why is somebody screaming at us here? <laughs> um, FY22 Select Board goal on establishing a means test of senior citizen property tax exemption or abatement. Did we, anybody think we were really going to have a workshop tonight? Oh, with an executive session? <laughs> what? <laughs> Do we have an executive session? Yeah, tonight? and it's and it's nine thirty. I think we're postponing this one. Uh, uh, support. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Good. Up. <laughs> upcoming. <laughs> upcoming. <laughs> here anyway. And yeah, yeah lose, I know. lose part of this. Upcoming <laughs> meeting and event schedule. So we. This is our last meeting of the year. Our next meeting is July fourth. Tuesday, 4th. July. January fourth. Yes. I, <laughs> I'm speeding the year along. January 4th is our next meeting. Um, we do have an executive session type. Before we get to there, any public comment from the public? Is there anybody raising their hand in the Zoom public world? None. Any public comment from the board? <coughs> uh, 
Before we go to executive session, I will say that I wish everybody in Lunenburg and all your uh, families a very Merry Christmas and a happy holiday if you do not celebrate Christmas, but one of the other holidays like Kwanzaa. And a healthy, happy new year as well. And, you know, I think we've, we've all hoping and think we've earned to some degree uh, a better 2022 than 2021. And maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe we'll see the waning, knock on wood, of the, of the virus and the pandemic. But until then, please uh, be safe yourselves and keep each other safe. So thank you. Uh, we have an executive session uh, pursuant to Mass General Law Chapter 30, Section 21, Paragraph 3, to discuss strategy with respect to litigation where an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the government's litigating position and the chair so declares, namely the Worcester Superior Court Docket Number 1985, CV00647, Lunenburg Board of Health versus uh, Goniner et al. Central Housing Court Docket Number 04H85CV000229, Massey versus Town of Lunenburg Zoning Board of Appeals, Superior Court uh, Civil Action Number 1985CV01033, Town of Lunenburg versus Oliva, Central Housing Court Docket Number 168, 16H. 85CV0812, <laughs> and approval of executive session meeting minutes related to these cases. Do I have such a motion to enter into executive session? So moved. Second. Uh, this is a roll call vote. Mr. Dwyer. Aye. Mr. Jeffries. Aye. And an aye from me. We will not be returning uh, to public session. We will be exiting right out of executive session. Uh, good night, everybody, and have a ha happy holiday.